Good to see committee members in person. We had a great dinner last night. Uh, welcome to CDC leadership and staff and guests uh, and those joining us virtually as well. Um, as required, uh, let's start with our usual roll call of committee members. And as a reminder, we all need to include a statement of conflict of interest. So I'll start, I'm David Fleming, I'm present today and I have no conflict of interest. And we'll go to Jill. Surprise. Surprise. Um, Jill Taylor, no conflicts of interest. Daniel. Good morning, Daniel Dawes, and I also have no conflicts of interest. Monica. Good morning, Monica Valdez Lupi, no conflicts of interest. Go around this way. Octavia Martinez, no conflicts of interest. Nirav Shah, I'm a director at Steris. Julie Marita, no conflicts. And uh, Rhonda. Rhonda Meadows, uh, no conflict of interest. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Rhonda. And let's just go around the table here for the CDC leadership that is present for a quick introduction. We'll start in that corner. Uh, good morning, I'm Paul Muttner, Acting Director, Office of Science. Erin Remley, Director of the Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, I am not Mandy Cohen. Uh, <laughs> I'm Ari Bernstein. I direct the National Center uh, on Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Hello, friends. Deb Howie, Chief Medical Officer. Uh, Ren Salerno, Acting Director of the Center for Laboratory Systems and Response. And Vicki Olson, the Deputy Director for the Office of Laboratory Science and Safety. Once again, welcome everybody. Uh, Dr. Rachel Hardman is uh, not here at the moment. She's at APHA, which is in town, giving a presentation, is Ubering over as soon as she's finished. And so will join us. And I think that one or two of our committee members during the day may need to step out for an APHA presentation as well. So some of you may notice that our committee is a little smaller today than the last time that we met as two of our members have rotated off since the last meeting. They're Dr. Lynn Goldman, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health at George Washington, and Dr. Michelle Albert, who's the Professor of Medicine and Cardiology Chair at the University of California, San Francisco. Lynn and Michelle have been great additions uh, to this committee, both in our full meetings, and then Lynn was on the data and surveillance work group, and Michelle was on the health equity work group. And on behalf of the committee and CDC, it's kind of a sad parting time, but I'd like to express our gratitude to both of them for their wisdom and their dedication to this group and its cause. Hopefully they're watching this morning, and uh, so I'd like to say thanks very much, uh, Lynn and Michelle. Uh, you know, Lynn and Michelle are examples of the kinds of leadership that we're able to get on our committee here um, to, to serve the ACD. And CDC and HHS have been working really hard to bring on additional outstanding committee members. Uh, there's no replacement for the folks that leave, but uh, as, as new members. But not all the I's have been dotted in the uh, folks that are coming on. So instead, we'll have to wait until our next meeting to officially bring them on board. And so stay tuned for that. We have a full meeting today. And in fact, uh, we, may, we may need to work together uh, to stay on time. So I'd ask for your help on that. As a brief preview, uh, we have uh, several presentations from CDC today, including one on their work to coordinate efforts across the federal system for programs that serve children and families. And a second on the decisions uh, made to regarding program reductions at CDC resulting from rescission of COVID uh, funding. And in addition, as a, is our custom, we'll hear from the director of CDC, the new director, Dr. Mandy Cohen. Uh, that will include a discussion of uh, topics on the ways that the ACD can prioritize our work going into the future to most help the CDC during this time and under its new leadership. And I'm pretty excited because we're gonna hear from each of our working groups as well, uh, laboratory improvement, health equity, and data and surveillance modernization. Working group recommendations are really a core part of what this committee does. Uh, and the good news is that CDC believes that it's uh, important to consistently report back to us on the steps they've taken to implement working group recommendations. So we're gonna do that today in some detail for each of our working groups. 
And because working groups are temporary by their definition, we're also going to be voting to sunset two of our working groups, laboratory improvement and health equity, as they've completed their terms of reference. But that, of course, doesn't mean that either CDC or the ACD thinks that the work in those areas is done. Uh, instead, it means that we're going to need to continue to work um, with CDC and as an ACD committee to think about these issues, to ensure that recommendations are being implemented, and to consider um, future working groups on these or related issues as they arise. And in fact, we're going to be doing that today with our data and surveillance work group as CDC has asked us to take, take on a new um, task for that group. And so we'll be voting on a new um, revised terms of reference for the data and surveillance working group. And now we need to get to work. So our first agenda item um, is a report from the laboratory working group. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll first have a report from CDC on their implementation of their recommendations to date. Then Jill and Josh are gonna present two final pieces of the terms of reference for pro a proposed action plans for us to potentially adopt as recommendations. So we'll vote on those. And finally, we'll conclude with a vote to sunset the group. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn this over now to Jill and to, uh, I need the slide to tell me who's going to be here from CDC. It is I. Oh, Vicki, there no, you are, Vicki. <laughs> I, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I have a cold and I'm trying not to infect anyone, so. Maybe you can move it a little closer there. Okay. All right. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So my name is Victoria Olson. I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Laboratory Science and Safety. Um, today, myself and Dr. Ren Salerno will be giving some updates about how we've been progressing on implementing some of the recommendations from the laboratory work group. Uh, next slide, please. We're having a little difficulty with our slides here. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. Go ahead to the next one. So the laboratory work group report was published in February, 2023 and had some excellent recommendations and the CDC has been actively working to uh, implement many of these. So we wanted to give an update today on the ones listed uh, here, how we have been um, elevating the position of the senior laboratory scientist, particularly the associate director for laboratory science and safety. How we have been, I know, furthering the comprehensive laboratory culture of quality through developing a enterprise-wide quality management system for laboratories. Also, how we have been ensuring that we do have that external review to make sure that our tests are fit for purpose prior to deployment. I'll then be turning it over to Ren to go into a little bit more detail about how we're consolidating key laboratory support functions into the, the Center for Laboratory Systems in Response, which was officially stood up on October 1st. And he will also go into a little bit more detail on how we are engaging with the public to identify um, uh, how we can develop tests for novel public health challenges and incorporate redundancy into the national responsibility for test development. So to begin with, I next slide, please. I believe everyone is familiar with the CDC Moving Forward initiative. And in that process, it was really designed to improve management, reduce bureaucracy, and strengthen CDC emergency readiness and response. As part of that, some important enterprise-wide functions were elevated into reporting directly to the immediate office of the director. That included the Office of Laboratory Science and Safety. The director of our office is the associate director for laboratory science and safety, um, Jim Perkle, who unfortunately is not able to be here today. The ADLSS is the single point of laboratory accountability for numerous regulations and policies and really has that senior level position and is part of the IOD. Next, please. In addition, and you will hear much more about this from Ren, we are creating the Center for Laboratory Systems and Response, and that will report to the ADLSS. The center will really be providing those cross-cutting laboratory operation and systems support, collaborating with clinical and public health laboratory systems, as well as federal partners, 
with the ultimate goal to support scientifically advanced response spreading and efficient laboratory response and diagnostic testing for infectious disease outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. Next, please. So we wanted, I wanted to mention a little bit how we have been fostering that culture of laboratory quality. We've made significant progress on a few different elements that really help support quality management for the laboratories. We have the quality manual for microbiological laboratories that is completed. This document helps provide those quality standards for the wide portfolio of activities that CDC laboratories do, which go from clinical diagnostics to surveillance to research, really making sure that we are meeting or exceeding regulatory requirements. The draft was, a, was first finished at the end of 2022 and has gone through extensive reviews that have improved it. This includes from reviews by the Center Laboratory Leadership, by the CDC Laboratory Community, and actually many of our APHL laboratory directors also provided their expertise to help strengthen the document. And we really appreciate all of the efforts. We are now beginning the implementation of this manual to really help um, foster that continual improvement in laboratory quality. We also are dedicated to providing an electronic quality management system that can be used throughout the agency. This EQMS is designed to be flexible, easy to use, and be a benefit to the laboratories for managing laboratory quality activities. You can see on the slide here listed many of the quality indicators that it will track. And in fact, the first two modules for document management and personnel training qualifications has already been launched to the pilot laboratories. We're actively looking to configure the other modules so that we can have this deployed as soon as possible. Next, please. For the recommendation on making sure our tests have an external review before deployment, we have developed the Infectious Disease Test Review Board. Now this board was actually set up in March, 2022, and its mission was to review and approve of all modified and new tests prior to being deployed outside of CDC. This Additional review by someone external to the program really makes sure that we have met all of the validation criteria and the test truly is fit for purpose, as well as making sure that the procedures are clear to someone who is not too close to the project. But even before the submission to the board, the quality process has begun within the center. As you can see in this timeline, which all occurs within the center, as the test is developed and validated, there is implemented a external review by a subject matter expert in the method prior to it being ready to be submitted to the board. It has to be reviewed by the Center Associate Director for Laboratory Science before it is ready to be submitted to the IDTRB. Next, please. Then in the IDTRB, after it receives the, pa the package, it engages further with two more uh, subject matter experts. We have a pool of volunteers who are experts within different test methodologies, and we're able to pull from them and have two of them review the package to make sure that it meets all the validation criteria, has clear, concise instructions, and can um, be easily deployed. The SMEs reviewers then provide their recommendations to the board. The board considers those and decides whether the package will be accepted. Uh, require modifications or be rejected. And this is a way that we're making sure we have a review external to the program, really making sure that the test is fit for purpose before it is going outside of the CDC, while simultaneously really further supporting and fostering that quality uh, continual improvement culture throughout the centers and the laboratories. And so this has been stood up. It is uh, progressing quite well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Salerno to talk about the new Center for Laboratory Systems in Response. Next slide. Okay, great. Thank you, Vicki. And um, also thank you to the ACD Laboratory Work Group. Um, hopefully uh, we are making it clear that you've made a significant impact on um, 
how we think about our work here at CDC, and we really appreciate um, all the support and um, ingenuity uh, behind your, your thoughtful recommendations. Uh, and obviously one of the, from my perspective, significant recommendations that the work group made in the February 2023 report was um, for the creation of a new laboratory center at CDC. And um, that has happened. Uh, it was approved in June um, <clears throat> officially and administratively the center came into uh, existence as of October 1st. And uh, we're now in the process of trying to staff the center and stand up the center and ensure that it has um, adequate resources to do all the great things that, that we hope uh, it can do. Um, this is the uh, sort of initial organizational chart for the center. Um, as Vicki said, the center director reports directly to the Associate Director for Laboratory Science and Safety, who is the senior most laboratory scientist uh, at the agency, <clears throat> um, which is, I think, extremely uh, important. As of today, the center um, has only one division in it, which is the Division of Laboratory Systems. But um, if some the slide could be advanced, please. Um, we have made a commitment that in FY24, the Division of Core Laboratory Services and Response will be incorporated into the center. And these two divisions really reflect what we're trying to do uh, with this center and, and frankly reflects uh, how innovative the center is for CDC. Uh, briefly, um, the Division of Laboratory Systems, as you may know, has been around for some time, but its role and responsibility is to engage external clinical, uh, clinical laboratory community. So it has the responsibility of um, managing uh, the cooperative agreement that the agency holds with the Association for Public Health Labs and uh, really has the responsibility uh, for CDC to ensure that the agency has a, a very productive uh, relationship with all of the public health labs uh, throughout the country. But in addition, it um, is the uh, CDC's uh, player in the federal tri-agency CLIA program, which is the regulatory program for uh, clinical laboratory medicine across the United States. And in that role, the Division of Laboratory Systems really is responsible for engaging, supporting, and um, working with all clinical laboratories across the country, whether they're commercial laboratories or hospital laboratories or uh, physician laboratories, um, to ensure uh, the quality of, of that work. So the Division of Laboratory Systems is very externally engaged um, with that clinical laboratory community. Uh, by contrast, uh, the Division of Core Laboratory Services and Response is, in, is an internal cross-cutting uh, laboratory support organization for CDC's laboratories. Um, both of these, neither of these divisions have a single pathogen or single disease that they're responsible for or program that they're responsible for. The, the program laboratories that focus on specific uh, diseases or pathogens are not a part of this center intentionally. Uh, this center is designed to be cross-cutting and um, to, to be supportive of all of CDC's programs, whether they are internally operating laboratories or in externally engaging the clinical laboratory community. So our hope is that between uh, these two divisions that are both cross-cutting, neither with a specific interest or um, pathogen or disease specific program, <clears throat> but um, and one focused purely on the internal operations of the agency and one focused entirely on the, the operation and uh, support to the external clinical laboratory community that jointly uh, these divisions and the center will be able to uh, represent a, a, a really new um, capacity at CDC around laboratory systems and response. 
Next slide, please. What I'd like to do now is point out a um, couple of significant changes that we've made to each of these divisions um, just this past summer. And hopefully these, um, these specific changes that I'll point out to you will demonstrate the commitment that we are making to uh, improving the way we think about laboratory preparedness and response at the agency, both externally and internally. Um, you'll notice on the left-hand side there, the national lab, we created a new branch in the Division of Laboratory Systems called the National Laboratory Response System Branch. Uh, this branch did not exist uh, before the summer. <clears throat> um, and what probably the most important change in that branch is that we moved the laboratory response network for biological, that program that was formerly an NC EZID into the Division of Laboratory Systems and into this branch. Why this branch? Because this is the branch, these are the people um, that also have had the responsibility for engaging the commercial laboratory sector. This is the branch that was frankly, mostly responsible for trans, uh, transitioning the CDC orthopox virus test to the five commercial laboratories during MPOX. So this is the branch that really maintains the agency's relationship with the commercial laboratory sector. Not only that, but this is also the branch that uh, has principally been the principal architect around improving laboratory data exchange external to the agency. So this is where we focus on um, developing and improving electronic test order and result reporting between public health laboratories and hospitals uh, in their jurisdictions. You'll also notice that not only did we move laboratory response network for biologicals into this branch so that we can um, think coherently and consistently about our relationship with public health laboratory response, as well as commercial, the support of commercial laboratories to public health response. But we also moved the ELIMS team into this branch. ELIMS is the Enterprise Laboratory Information Management System. It is the data system that all of our infectious disease laboratories at CDC use, um, and uh, the system that we use to transmit test results from CDC back out to public health laboratories. So we're marrying up our internal electronic laboratory management system, data system, with the work that we're doing externally between with public health laboratories and clinical laboratories. Ideally, over time, we'll ensure that that electronic data system <clears throat> is, uh, that we approach it holistically, um, that we're thinking about data transmission from laboratories at CDC in the same way we're thinking about data transmission from public health laboratories to uh, uh, clinical laboratories and 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 vice versa, um, so that that system will will ideally over time work much more um, um, smoothly than it has in the past. Um, and also, it's important, I think, from my perspective, to emphasize that we are we recognize the criticality of laboratory data exchange with laboratory preparedness and response, and so we're putting all of that uh, essential. Uh, programmatic work together in one branch, as opposed to having it spread across many different centers uh, and many diff uh, much different leadership uh, as it had been in the past. The next slide, please. So this is the division of core laboratory services and response. Um, this is the division that is scheduled to move into the center in FY24. Um, and um, it has also created a new branch um, over the summer called, you'll see in yellow, the Preparedness Response and Outbreak Support Branch. This branch is essentially the mirror image of the branch in the other division that I just described to you that was focused on external laboratory uh, preparedness and response. This branch is now entirely focused on internal CDC support to CDC laboratories for preparedness and response. So we've now um, created a hopefully permanent surge, CLIA surge laboratory testing facility within this branch that it will be available to support CLIA testing uh, during any public health response. Um, that did not exist before COVID. Um, we've also um, are building within this branch 
um, hopefully over time, a more, as uh, Vicki alluded to, a more standardized process across the agency for new test development, um, as well as for uh, test uh, de um, deployment um, from CDC out to the public health laboratories or clinical laboratories as necessary. Um, so again, standardizing the way we think about laboratory preparedness and response from within CDC so that we're less reliant on uh, just individual subject matter expert laboratories um, uh, to handle all response functions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other thing I'll do quickly is talk about a couple of initiatives that we have taken over the summer and in this fall um, that hopefully uh, recognize many of the comments um, and recommendations that came from your laboratory work group. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a request for information that was out um, to the public during October, specifically asking for the private sector to tell us how they could better support surge laboratory testing during public health responses. Now, we were able to surge, obviously, to the private sector during COVID and also during um, MPOX, but both of those um, transitions from pu public sector, public health laboratories to private sector clinical laboratories was ad hoc, to be absolutely frank. Um, and we didn't have a, a well-honed system here um, process here at CDC to help manage that transition. And so we, we are asking the private sector to help us understand um, what they uh, would need. Um, theoretically, if we could identify the resources, how we could um, contract with, them, with the private sector in advance so that that transition from public health laboratory testing to uh, private sector clinical laboratory testing during public health emergencies could be much uh, more um, executed more quickly and, and more smoothly. Um, we did receive nine responses, eight commercial laboratories, as well as uh, one large um, government contractor. Um, a lot of great information that we're now um, processing. Next slide, please. This, oh, okay, you somehow we got ahead a slide or we missed the slide. Okay, um, so thank you. Um, this is the second RFI that um, we now have on the street. Um, and <clears throat> the first one was about surge testing. The second RFI is about test production and, and um, test modification. So we need help clearly um, from the private sector to be able to very quickly and with high quality develop new tests um, especially um, if we are encountering outbreaks of, of disease that we are unfamiliar with or that for which we do not have a readily available test. Um, historically, as you know, we've relied on the agency or an SME lab to, to be responsible entirely for that test production. We want to diversify that capability and be able to engage appropriately with the private sector for help in doing new test production. But also, perhaps even more importantly, is uh, test modification. And we needed to do this during the MPOX outbreak where we needed to rely on commercial laboratories uh, to take an, an existing CDC test that was a relatively simple test but could not be used in a high throughput uh, commercial laboratory setting and modify that test and get that test, mod test modification approved and authorized by FDA before um, we could take advantage of the high throughput testing in commercial laboratories. That took time. It also, we were only able to do it because five commercial laboratories uh, offered to do that work for us for free. And we're not sure that, we don't wanna count on that in the future. And we also don't wanna have to spend the time um, uh, in during an emergency to um, do that kind of work. So this RFI is asking the private sector to tell us how they could help us um, <clears throat> prepare uh, better our existing tests for high throughput settings, as well as potentially help us uh, develop new tests when they're absolutely needed. Next slide, please. Okay, the other thing that we have um, done is we've uh, awarded a contract to Griffin Scientific, and this is specifically sort of at a more high level, but again, this was um, something that not only the laboratory work group called for, but also many um, publications by outside experts have, uh, have made clear over the last 
especially the last six to nine months. And that is, can someone please in the government define this national laboratory response system and how it works? And you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of all the various players in this complex system <clears throat> that spans hospitals and commercial laboratories and physician office labs and uh, urgent care centers and nursing homes and public health labs um, of various ca capacities and sizes and how do they all work together and what, is the, what does it look like? How, can we articulate that in writing in a way that helps everyone understand their roles in advance of an emergency rather than we sort of figure it out on the fly? And so we are going to work really hard over the next uh, 12 months to, to do exactly that. And um, obviously, we will, we will reach out for uh, considerable support from many of you as we um, develop this report and, and hopefully be able to publish it and, uh, within the next year. And then uh, last slide, please, is just a summary of um, what we're hoping that this new center will be able to do. Um, <clears throat> cross-cutting laboratory operations and system support for all of CDC's infectious disease labs, including the standardization of test development, support for laboratory animal studies. Um, but also this is going to be the place that is responsible for engaging um, not only CDC, but all of our federal partners in this laboratory and diagnostic space. Um, so whether it's FDA or CMS or ASPR or BARDA um, or APHL or ACLA or all the all of the organizations that are so deeply invested in in this field, um, this center is going to be uh, principally responsible for engaging and ensuring um, that we understand their concerns and their capacities, um, and they understand what we're trying to do. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Um, but again, I just want to express my thanks, especially to Josh and Jill and the laboratory work group for the work that they did and helping us shape um, many, if not most, of the ideas um, that we're trying to implement with the center. Great, thanks very much. Uh, you've been busy. The uh, floor is open. Uh, uh, thank you for your work. I'm really excited by this work group uh, and uh, the fact that the word response is right there in your title. That's such a clear message to everyone. You, you spoke at the end about some partnerships across CMS and CDC and others. I was wondering how that's shaping up very specifically in regards to the work that Jen Layden is helping lead with the new data office, and then the CFA with uh, Dylan, uh, the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analysis, because that's also a response. What are the kinds of partnerships or what are you thinking about in those two spaces? So you're asking, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Uh, the question is specifically about the internal partnerships between this center, Jen Layden's office and Dylan's office. Yeah, um, absolutely. We recognize how important uh, their roles are in preparedness and response. And as, I would say that the relationship uh, between this brand new center and Jen Layden's office is much more mature than um, it is with, with CFA. Um, the reason I say that is because we've been working um, uh, in, in my old division, the Divisional Laboratory Systems, with Jen Layden's office and the DMI program for, for years now. In fact, our electronic test order and result reporting work, um, the laboratory data exchange strategy um, has been central to much of the work of uh, the Divisional Laboratory Systems for years. And as a result, we've been actively engaged um, with her office and her staff um, throughout. And so I think the relationship is uh, there is quite strong. Um, CFA is still getting itself stood up. Um, and we've had lots of meetings um, with their, their leadership. They know who we are. We know who they are. Um, I'm not sure that you know, I would say that the relationship, is, I, I did say that the relationship is not as mature because we're not doing active work with them in the same way that we're actively working um, uh, with uh, the DMI organization. Thanks, Josh and then Drew. Thanks, and I, I wanna start by just so appreciating all the work that has happened at CDC and also just the incredible, um, 
collaboration that the work group had with everybody at CDC talking about these challenges very candidly. And um, it's just really great to see this moving forward. And I completely accept that it is everything you've talked about is so much in line with uh, how the work group, which really brought a lot of different views together, really, um, uh, really felt. So it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear the presentation. I, I had a, just a, a couple quick questions, um, just following up on maybe some of the minor points in, in the report. Um, one of them, um, as we look back on that uh, COVID test, was that the emergency response structure didn't have all the labs that were part of making that test kind of under it. And I wonder whether you think that is, um, you know, whether you've gotten to the kind of design of the um, incident command so that that challenge could be resolved, depending, I mean, it could be any kind of test, so not necessarily those kinds, but that, that, that the incident command could look over not just the core labs, but also the, um, you know, the other particular labs so that there's like a coherent management in the crisis. And then my second question is that one of the rec other recommendations was to consolidate labs at the division le le level or if not possible, the branch level and just sort of the, you know, what you're, uh, you've got plenty of change that you're managing right here, but uh, how you think about that recommendation now. Take that one. Yeah, so I'll start with the second question, then I'll turn it back to Ren. And before I do that, I just want to echo what Ren has pointed out. We did, and what Josh was pointing out, we did so enjoy working with the laboratory work group. It was a great exchange of wonderful ideas, and we really value all of the input that you gave. Uh, we are working towards um, consolidating laboratories at the branch level. Um, I can't give you an overview of how that is through all of the different centers today, but I know that is actively being pursued. And I know uh, actually Deb Bowery is but making sure that that keeps moving forward. Um, so that is, we are moving towards having the laboratories consolidated at a branch level. I'll move it to Ryan. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. Thank you for your question about future responses uh, and, and sort of centralization of laboratory activities. Um, so from my point of view, my perspective, um, I think, that, you know, we need to stand up the center, we need the center to um, uh, be recognized as adding true value to um, CDC and the overall um, public health system. Um, and I trust uh, that once we do that, <laughs> um, that the, the community and the culture within CDC, especially the, the, that that thinks about how we organize ourselves during uh, public health responses will recognize that this center should be, you know, at the forefront of, of laboratory operations and thinking um, for every response. And um, that the center will have some sort of, you know, in my, my vision is that the center would be, um, have a permanent seat, if you will, um, within our graduated response uh, structure, such that every response that had that looks like it would, could be of any significant size or shape would um, have to include the leadership um, that comes out of the Center for Laboratory Systems and Response, and that it would be incumbent on and res the responsibility of this new center to ensure exactly what you said, which is that we are not. Um, that we're taking an agency um, systems approach to laboratory response, and we're not putting all of our eggs in the basket of an individual subject matter expert laboratory, but that we're immediately bringing that expertise into a, a organization that has, um, you know, a lot of expertise uh, in general around test development, test distribution, you know, test laboratory data exchange. Um, and so, but I think it will take some time, but, you know, for this center to establish that reputation and be yeah. given that responsibility. Well, I, I appreciate just a super quick follow-up. I, I totally appreciate that. And in a way the quest, that question really isn't as much addressed to you because you are doing the work that you need to do to stand this up as it is maybe more generally to the CDC that, um, 
you know, you can have a great center and a lot of expertise, but in the moment, it's really important that people, somebody is empowered over all the different labs. So you don't have a situation where the labs are kind of pointing a finger at each other and, and things can happen in the gaps between the labs in an emergency, however that is thanks, done. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, Deb is gonna make a comment at the end, hopefully related to that. Uh, then Julie, uh, Daniel, and then last by Deb. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just, I, first, I want to just commend you for the work that first the laboratory survey laboratory work group and also you all for the work that's been done. It was so clear that you were took the recommendations to heart and are responding to them really thoughtfully and carefully. Um, I, I was just really impressed with it. And I, what I am impressed with too is it's not glamorous shiny objects that you're addressing, but you're really looking at the fundamentals of the work that need to be done. And, and so Thank you so much for doing that. It's necessary and, and so valuable. Um, I have a question that kind of builds on Josh's a little bit in terms of the um, how, how much power and authority that you have. It also, I'm also wondering about the resources. Do you feel that you have the adequate resources to stand up the center in a way that is most impactful? Because I think part of it is I see that you're doing things kind of in a systematic, slow way. Is that because of you wanting to be careful or is it a matter of lack of resources? So I guess I'm yeah, that's a question for you all. And the other, the last thing I'll say is just, I think um, uh, uh, Billy Anirov's comment, I, I can see a, a place for us, the DMI initiative working really closely with you all as we move, as they move forward. Because I think when we look at the future TOR or the tour, um, I think that there's an incredible need for there to be this kind of collaborative effort across the different offices. And I think that there's great opportunity as it relates to the data exchange. But thank, thank you so much. I was worried this question would come up, but, <laughs> um, you know, I think um, what I would say is I'm, I'm really proud of the agency for moving forward with creating a brand new center um, in a challenging fiscal environment. Um, and unlike the Center for Forecasting Analysis, um, there is no congressional mandate, uh, much less congressional line item that specifically said uh, this center must be created and here is X uh, millions of dollars a year to sustain the center. Um, and so from that perspective, it, I would argue that it was, um, it took a lot of leadership um, for the agency to declare publicly that we would create a new center, which doesn't happen very often, as far as I know, at CDC. And, and frankly, there's never been a laboratory-specific center in the, in the agency's history. <laughs> um, to, to do that without um, the assurances of uh, you know, a congressional line item. Um, so, but with that said, um, you know, I think there's a, uh, a fiscal reality here and which I well appreciate that, um, we have no choice, but to, uh, to stand up the center in a deliberative, um, admittedly, uh, gradual fashion, um, to take uh, existing resources that the agency is willing to redirect um, to help uh, stand up the center. Um, and that is incumbent upon those of us who are responsible for the center to um, you know, help uh, demonstrate its value and help um, build its reputation both internally and externally. And um, over time, we uh, trust that um, the the resources will will come and will increase. Um, so, and I think that goes, you know, back to the earlier question about its um, responsibilities, and and um, you know, those responsibilities will evolve over time as well, right? And um, I think initially, uh, you know, right now there's only I think uh, three employees in the center, um, and we're trying we're actively recruiting as fast as we can. Um, but we won't be able um, to hire uh, hundreds of people into the center. We don't have those resources today. Um, <clears throat> but um, I don't think 
that you know that that's necessary for this in the in the short term for the center to succeed and i think um that uh, we can over time build the center and its reputation both internally and externally and i think i think the the elevation of our relationship with the broad clinical laboratory community is is going to be really important and will really give us um could result in uh, a lot of support outside CDC for this center. And I think that will also, if we're successful, um, you know, help the center grow. And as the center grows it, and its reputation improves both internally and externally, um, I trust its responsibilities um, in future responses will also grow commensurately. Thanks, last fairly quick question, Daniel. All right, thank you. So um, I too wanna to thank you for that insightful presentation. And um, I just wanted to make this comment and then ask a quick question. One of the things that we've struggled with in this country whenever there's disease outbreaks, epidemics, pandemics, is realizing an equitable response. And I wanted to build off Narab's question by asking how have you all been engaged with the Office of Health Equity and how do you plan to engage with them to ensure that we can realize an equitable response in the future? Thank you. Yeah, so um, absolutely great question. Um, you know, I will acknowledge that I've had this job for about a week. Um, and um, uh, I will tell you that I, I personally in this job have not yet uh, engaged the Office of Health Equity. I will tell you that uh, on, the, on the org chart, um, you know, among the first 10 uh, positions in the center that I currently have funding to, to fill is a uh, senior health equity coordinator. And so it is absolutely essential um, function, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for the center to have health equity square and, and front and center for, for the work uh, that we do. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope that's an adequate response, and I hope that in the future I'll be able to demonstrate um, more work in that area. Thanks very much, Deb. Oh, I'm sorry, Octavio. Thanks, David. Um, great, uh, great presentation. Also, thank you, Victoria. Uh, thinking about future responses, I was just having the thought from a layman's perspective, thinking about the status and interoperability of the data exchange with all the clinical laboratories. So I really appreciate that slide showing the public-private laboratory ecosystem and how complex it is. Thinking about that and now this new approach and center, could you tell us where we are currently from your perspective about interoperability with all the laboratories and what do you see the vision within what time frame to actually improve that ability for data exchange, which I think is critical for the next PHE when it finally does arrive, unfortunately. Okay, um, and I can't just defer that question to Jen Layden. <laughs> um, uh, geez, I, I, mean, I think, look, we, we have made tremendous strides um, uh, during the pandemic, we made tr tremendous strides during the pandemic in what we call uh, ELR or electronic laboratory reporting. Um, there was very little electronic laboratory reporting of public health data um, prior to the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, uh, you know, we, for the most part, um, uh, the overwhelming majority of laboratory test results um, w were. Uh, reported electronically to jurisdictions um, and then from jurisdictions into um, CDC, as well as the federal government. Um, and that was a huge um, leap forward, if you will, for laboratory uh, reporting. I know you're asking a much broader question about interoperability, which is, you know, um, uh, yeah, I think we'll be working on um, well past the end of my career. Um, what, where I think we're headed next and what we're working actively on is 
um, not only one-way reporting from the laboratories that are performing the tests to the public health department and on to CDC, but is a more um, uh, fluid two-way um, electronic reporting system such um, that both test results, not only test results, but test uh, orders are transmitted electronically um, from one facility to another, and those results are transmitted electronically back, um, especially when those orders and results cross uh, the sort of public healthcare boundary. Um, we have a lot of work to do there, um, but we are making a lot of progress. And on the laboratory front, you know, what we are envisioning, and again, Jen Layden's organization is uh, responsible for this and, and leading this, but we are supporting it because we are working on, on the laboratory piece of data modernization, is the concept of using um, uh, intermediaries specific intermediaries, um, uh, the APHL Information Management System or AIMS and the um, report stream, which is a CDC uh, intermediary um, that will allow any, any entity, any laboratory that is uh, performing public health tests to uh, send their test results into the, those intermediaries through us. And those intermediaries will uh, standardize the, um, the, the data and the elements associated with that data and um, automatically distribute those results to any and all entities, whether it's jurisdictions or the federal government or CDC, um, that, that need that data instantly. And also be, those intermediaries will also enable um, the the de-identification of that data, right? So that only jurisdictions re receive the identified data, the government and the CDC would receive the de-identified data. That process, you know, has, has historically been very complicated and, and, and time consuming and, um, and really slowed down our response. But, but we, we do envision if we can persuade the, the broad laboratory system and the community to engage and use the, this intermediary concept um, that we will significantly improve um, the, the, what we're calling the laboratory data exchange system um, that will not only benefit us significantly during public health responses, but, but also just Im improve the uh, healthcare and the interoperability, if I can use that word in this way, uh, between um, public health labs and, and laboratories in the healthcare system. Um, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of resources, but I do think we have a, a good strategy there. Thank you, Rana. I appreciate that elegant answer because it's an elegant vision. It's gratifying to see all of this response from you. Thanks very much. And we are running short on time. So Rhonda, a uh, quick question. Not a question, just. Rhonda, you went on, you, somehow you went on mute again. It's because I sound better on mute. <laughs> no, I was saying no, no questions. Actually, just a warm appreciation for the presentation you just provided. You anticipated our questions, um, showed us your progress to date, which is pretty significant. Love the new org structure and just your responsiveness to um, the input from our committee and from stakeholders. Job well done and uh, congratulations in your new role. Thanks for that comment, Rhonda, great. Uh, last comment to you, Deb. And, and thanks Rhonda for that. That was feedback that came from all of you um, that our work groups, we appreciate the um, recommendations that are um, generated by you all. So we want to make sure that at CDC today in particular um, for each of um, the sessions, we're able to talk about the progress made. I really want to thank um, Jill and Josh for all their work with the lab work group, certainly Ren and Vicki, and then um, can't go without, you know, thanking Jim Perkle, who was really um, had a vision for a lot of this. Um, I did just want to be very clear for funding, we have zero. 
um, zero dollars for this, um, additional dollars. And um, when Sherry presents the um, COVID rescissions, you'll see that we had some like plus ups or one-time funds that we were able to do for some of these activities that has gone away. Um, and so we are doing what we can um, with an existing or decreasing resources. So I just want to be very clear on that. There's a lot we would like to do, but are unable to do because of um, restraints. I also am really proud of this group and of all of our lab scientists. Change is not easy. Um, and I can tell you, I participated in 19 listening sessions with lab scientists, lab administrators um, across the agency um, around a lot of these recommendations and the structure. Um, we certainly, my vision was division level, but um, you have to bring people along. You can't force things on people. And so branch was the way to go um, for now. And even that has caused, you know, a lot of angst and consternation and, and lots of phone calls. And so for us, it's helping move things in the right direction and the constraints that we have. And we do have a um, SOP for response now. We're looking at how we do responses overall with graduated levels. So I think we're in a much better place in part thanks to the lab work group, but certainly the group of um, scientists and leaders at CDC. So thank you all. And thanks very much for coming this morning and, and presenting. You can see there's a lot of interest here and we're, it's really gratifying again to, to see the progress that you're making and we look forward to continue to work with you. And the laboratory working group is not quite done because there's still two um, elements of their terms of reference that need to be uh, presented and voted upon. So we're running a little bit late, Josh and Jill, I'd like you to move quickly through this, but uh, you're on. Um, uh, thank you, and I will talk quickly. Um, next slide, please, and the next slide. So um, first of all, as everyone else has said, uh, working with CDC and their scientists has been a pleasure. They've been open, honest, responsive, and it's really made our job um, much easier. So we have two terms of reference to uh, talk about today. This one essentially um, is about how CDC stays at the forefront of technology. Technology is changing so quickly. I mean, if there's one good thing about the pandemic, it's the advances in technology that that actually happened. So now how do we take advantage of that and move forward? And really the key to that is partnerships with academia and, and industry. And I just love listening to Vicky and Ren because you've already, you're already doing this. So this is really good, but I'd like to um, um, advance on that. So next slide, please. So uh, this is just our process. Uh, we met just once virtually. We had outside uh, subject matter experts from um, NIH and BADA. We also talked with uh, Dr. Salerno and Dr. McCannell. Um, next slide, please. So um, these are the challenges. CDC is um, a government bureaucracy. That's that's the sort of bottom line, and we understand that. But we feel that CDC's engagement practices are complex, lengthy, and time consuming. They don't really have the resources that they need um, to, um, to build the relationships with industry and academia that are going to require fund funding. And this also the, the government um, um, approach to working with private industry in terms of favoring one after another. And I think we have to take that into account that that's the, a reality. But the conclusion really was that there are other agencies in the federal government that do engage with academia and um, private industry in a more flexible and um, approachable way. And so uh, next slide, please. We, we use these three examples. During the pandemic, the NIH's RADx program made huge advances in dealing with industry, certainly advanced the development of point of care and rapid tests greatly, which is a huge boon to public health. Uh, BADA has ongoing relationships with um, industry that um, 
uh, are very productive. And the Department of Energy actually has very interesting strategic partnership programs that we, uh, we talked about. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna make clear that CDC is already working with private partners. And uh, Ren gave us a few examples of this. The um, MOU for monkeypox with um, the uh, commercial labs, which was done without resources. And, and that was something I learned. I had assumed there was money behind that and there was not. So that was really good to know. Um, the SPHERES collaboration around uh, whole genome sequencing was a collaboration with uh, public health labs, labs, academic institutions, and the private sector. Um, the Pathogenomic Centers of Excellence, which was stood up last year, I think, uh, five or six um, collaborations around the country between public health uh, agencies and they had to have a partner with academia. Um, and uh, at the moment there are ongoing discussions with and work with RADx and CDC and one particular industry partner collaborating on H hepatitis C elimination. So there are clearly examples of, of CDC doing this already. Next slide, please. And this is the one that is incredibly important to me. And uh, Ren has also already started talking about using the term national laboratory system. During the pandemic, it became so clear that one part of the laboratory in sector of the laboratory industry can't do everything. Everybody had a different role at a different stage. And so having a national discussion about what a national laboratory system is for both peacetime to sort of figure out the roles and responsibilities and then act um, in emergency is incredibly important. And we think that CDC as the um, premier reference laboratory in the country should take a huge role in building this. And uh, as Ren showed you, they're already starting to do this. So we're just really excited about being part of that conversation. Next slide. So the proposed action steps, we don't think that CDC should um, reinvent the wheel in terms of what NIH, um, BADA, um, Department of Energy are doing, but by getting closer to those agencies and becoming a partner in the relationships and enhancing the relationships, we think that CDC can bring um, skills and access to real life situations that um, would be very important. We think that CDC should make working with the private sector just an accepted part of everything they do. Um, you know, getting it in their DNA is such an overused term now, but that's what we mean. It should be just part of what they do as part of the system. The third bullet is, is a somewhat sensitive bullet, I have to be frank. CDC's, um, some of CDC's labs have a very poor turnaround time in terms of dealing with rare and esoteric diseases. And the question came up of whether some of the large um, academic medical centers that have major reference laboratories could play a role with CDC in, <coughs> developing a more efficient approach to testing for these rare diseases. Um, the fourth bullet, this is the national laboratory system. This is to me, one of the most important things that we as a public health community need to do at this point in time. And the last one is a bit self-serving. We think that there should be um, laboratory subject matter experts on all your advisory committees in the future. Um, sorry about that, but I think it's, we think it's important. Next slide. Um, Josh was going to give um, color and um, formality and corrections to what I was going to say. Um, I, I thought you did a fantastic job, Joe, <laughs> about saying color. So um, very, very well stated. And maybe if there's any questions before we proceed to a vote. 
Why don't we go ahead and um, if people are agreeable, I'd like to ask one of you to make a motion to adopt the proposed action steps that you just outlined as official recommendations from the ACD. We can have discussion after that. Do I have a motion? Perfect, so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Sorry. Discussion. I mean, these issues is a really important um, area uh, that you've highlighted in some of your previous work, but calling it out in this way, I think is critically important. Yeah, well, one thing to say is that we appreciate the, the RFA RFI process, which can be used for like bigger questions, but there should be some mechanisms for engagement that don't require that. And sometimes it appears that, um, you know, with rules and ground rules and structures for them, but um, some ability to, to be able to work a little more nimbly. Julie? I'm just wondering a little bit about whether or not these recommendations, if we should direct them at particular parts of CDC, because it, it could be that if we direct these toward the center, does that provide you wind behind your sails to get some more, more resources? Just a question. Well, the fact that, <clears throat> I think it's a good point. The fact that the ACD is making these recommendations to the director, I think uh, makes it clear that from a resource perspective that we need to be looking across the agency. Any other discussion on this? If not, I'd like to go ahead and call for a vote. All those in favor of the proposed motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed or abstentions? If not, this uh, carries unanimously. C congratulations, a very important work. Thanks to the committee. And we'll move on now to part two. Okay, part two. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Ren talked about recruiting scientists, recruiting staff. And this is uh, the focus of this terms of reference. How can CDC better recruit and retain outstanding laboratory scientists um, to ensure high quality advanced laboratory testing? And this is basic to all the scientific work that happens at CDC. Next slide, please. This is our process. We uh, met virtually in October. We talked to Dr. Tara Henning, who leads the laboratory leadership service um, to um, excellent individuals from the Office of Human Resources, Kelly Mathis and Jason Washington, um, also uh, Vicki Olson and Wendy Kunert. And we had a very frank discussion. Um, next slide, please. Again, the administrative processes are not helping I think is the best way I can say the ability for CDC to hire the uh, highly um, well-educated from very complex backgrounds, st scientific staff that CDC needs. Even when technically qualified people are identified getting them to a job is incredibly hard. And the result is a shortage of talent. And I think that in the new center, you're gonna need the right people with the right expertise. And so we have to think about ways that CDC can um, develop recruiting processes that are appropriate, equitable, and, um, and done in the right way but that allow um, qualified scientists to come in because we actually think that this is a vulnerability and a pub putting um, CDC's work at public health risk. Um, next slide, please. We feel that um, other federal agencies um, that have a strong science component um, are able to attract and recruit um, scientific expertise in ways that it seems CDC cannot. And uh, we believe that um, the Office of Human Resources should work with other federal agencies to look at their practices, see what they're doing, and be informed um, um, by, by doing that. 
we we heard that there isn't a good career path for scientists at CDC. There is no logical way that scientists who are really good at bench work and overseeing the science can progress in their careers. And establishing a career path, we think, is incredibly important. Um, we also would like CDC to look at the Laboratory Leadership Service program, which is a, an amazing program at CDC, a two-year program. Um, many of the fellows who um, graduate from the Laboratory Leadership Service stay in public health, which is really great. But there's a dearth of um, clear qualified, uh, board qualified um, scientists nationally, and especially at CDC, that we think that adding a, an extra year um, to the laboratory leadership service should to um, get fellows ready to sit for the board exams would be a huge step forward. We understand that this was looked at before and not supported, so we would urge CDC to look at it again. I want to, um, I don't want to be critical of the Office of Human Resources because they're doing their job assuring that all their practices are equitable and, and appropriate, but we need, we definitely need more flexibility in the hiring practices to, um, to be able to attract and retain uh, qualified scientists at CDC. Next slide, please. Josh, you're on. Come on. Okay. I'm gonna make the motion to adopt the work group um, action items as recommendations from the ACD. Fantastic. Do we have a second? Any further discussion on this? I just wanted to quickly add, um, you've done a lot of great work. This particular one really caught my eye as far as pointing out the realities of some of the relatively straightforward steps that in theory are possible that CDC could take, given that it is a government bureaucracy to actually better make the recruiting system work to bring in the required talent. So thanks very much for that. This, this is important. Octavio. Yeah, great, great, great work, uh, Jill and Josh. As you were looking at this, um, did you also take a look at internally for the CDC as leadership is being identified that they're actually providing leadership skill development I see this often doesn't happen in bureaucracies or in large organizations, even in academia. We have a tendency to promote from your history and what you've done and not help you to actually go to the next step and be as successful as you move into those leadership sort of uh, positions, which are different from what probably brought you to the attention to get the leadership position, which is often our clinical and or laboratory skill sets. Just wondering if you took a look at that. That's, I, I, don't, I don't think we went into that level of granularity. It was mostly getting people in the door with the right qualifications. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a very good point you're making, though. It's, it's just um, the challenges right now are that people who are doing hiring for lab positions are, can be quite frustrated, even able to get the applications in from people who they know are applying to get, be able to, to interview them. Monica. Thank you so much for sharing these updates. And um, I was just curious in the conversations among the work group or with our CDC colleagues on the challenges around recruitment and retention within CDC, if, if you also discuss the similar challenges that are happening at some of the larger health departments that have uh, labs and then certainly at the state health departments and was curious about sort of a more enterprise systems approach and recruitment into the field and opportunities for um, um, laboratorians at the state level, for example, to move into CDC and vice versa. So that was one question. And then uh, second question, um, having been able to collaborate with other uh, agencies, um, mechanisms that might be available for IPAs or to have um, similarly trained uh, in the private industry or academia be placed within uh, CDC is another thought. Thanks. 
Um, so there's more detail in our report of absolute, you know, of, of specific mechanisms. Um, fellowships is a really good idea, two-way fellowships, so that um, um, academia or private industry can work at CDC and vice versa. Definitely that's one. Um, there are specific recommendations also um, about making sure that all recruitments go outside, not all recruitments um, most, some of them are aimed at pre-existing employees, not the, the full field. So, you know, there's some specific recommendations there. Your comment about the shortage nationwide is absolutely true. There's been a huge exodus of public health and laboratory scientists after the pandemic, just everywhere. Um, and so I think we have to use all mechanisms available to get people interested, get young people interested in science and laboratory careers and raise the profile of the value of a laboratory career um, in, in young graduates, but they're gonna take time to grow. And so there, there definitely is a gap that we're dealing with in the short term. Great, thanks. Great questions. Let's go ahead and, and call the vote. All those in favor of adopting the motion that's been proposed, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there opposed or abstentions? If not, the motion carries, and these will become recommendations of the ACD. Thank you. And now, next slide. It's almost impossible to say thank you, but I'm going to ask Jill and Josh to lead these couple of slides in preparation for a vote to sunset the laboratory working group. You go ahead. Well, um, in general, I think we've we've hit the the note about how appreciative we are for the chance to do this. Can we work. go to the next slide okay. while you talk, please? Perfect. Yeah. Um. Good. Here is the fantastic laboratory work group representing many different uh, sectors within the laboratory world. Um, we had uh, many productive conversations with them. Um, it's it was. Uh, fantastic uh, experience. And we want to uh, formally thank them. Maybe I'll just quickly mention Dr. Varma, Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Caliendo, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, Dr. Gutierrez, Dr. Rakeman, Dr. Patel, Dr. Kubin, Dr. Kimsey, Dr. Linfield, Dr. Southern, and Dr. Tony. So it was just uh, a great group. Well, I'm happy to follow on Deb's. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, and uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, we uh, really do want to thank both both uh, John Auerbach and uh, Dr. Howry for their shepherding of this whole process. Um, we didn't really um, know how to proceed right. in uh, when we started, and we, we got. A, pretty far. I also want to give a special shout out to Lauren Hoffman, who did a phenomenal amount of work um, with us and was like there at every step, um, every email, every um, chance to make sure we had the correct updated drafts or slides for everyone and um, just set up and ran everything uh, with, with perfect precision. We, this could not have uh, come together without her. Um, and also all the people who came to the uh, working group over the many meetings that we had um, and answered questions uh, very uh, candidly, uh, really, really helpful and allowed us to put forward meaningful recommendations. Um, Jill, any? Uh, we, we just had some great conversations then. So I learned a lot as much as I hope that we've been helpful to CDC and um, I hope we can continue some of the conversations. So I just thank you to everybody. Great, we, we've, um, we can make it a small joke if I'm permitted. Okay, that we may explore creating a virtual Lauren Hoffman to help us with informal meetings of the uh, group for reunion purposes only, not for policy making or public purposes. Um, all right. 
Um, I think that go to the next slide, please. To yes. the end of a our little tear coming yeah, to my eye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I would entertain at this point a motion to sunset the laboratory working group uh, as they completed their terms of reference. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there opposed or abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, and although Jill and Joss have just said it, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to express our thanks to this incredible working group. I had the opportunity to be part of a couple of the meetings and uh, saw both the group and the CDC support in action. It was quite amazing. And I can't let, and we can't let this moment pass without commenting on one other attribute of this working group, and that's the leadership of its incredible co-chairs, Jill and Josh. I think if the term dynamic duo had not been already invented, we would have needed to have invented it for this. And- Just for the record, I'm Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And you two are not done. Um, as we said before, sunsetting a work group because the TORs have been completed doesn't mean that anyone and the CDC or ACD thinks the job is done. Instead, we're gonna rely on you two to assure that the ACD continues to hear from CDC on its implementation of these recommendations and um, identification of emerging laboratory issues as they arise in the future, um, both uh, uh, consideration of work groups by this committee and across CDC. So Jill and Josh, Laboratory Working Group, uh, CDC staff, thank you. Wow. Wrong time. Deb didn't think we could get there. Um, uh, let's go, go go to the next slide, however, so we can stay on time. And uh, we're going to make a, a change of pace here. And I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Sherling Wong to, uh, to this group. Um, she's the Senior Advisor for Health Strategy at CDC, um, newly at CDC, bringing a lot of uh, skills and experience from a variety of places, including the state level, near and dear to my heart. And she's going to be talking us to this, to this morning about one of Dr. Cohen's uh, uh, priorities, protecting health as a team sport, supporting young families. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Really excited to share a little bit more information about one of our focus areas and also have discussion with you all about how to really move the work forward and have the impact that we're looking for. Uh, next slide, please. So on the left side of this slide, these are the three focus areas that Dr. Cohen has identified for the CDC, and she'll be talking about these a little bit more in her remarks later. Um, these include identifying and responding rapidly to health threats, which includes our work on the fall winter respiratory season, which of course we're deep in currently. The second is improving mental health and combating overdoses. And then the third that I'll be focused more on today is supporting young families. And within these focus areas, we've been talking about how to meet our mission to protect health. And if we didn't know it before COVID, we certainly know it now and have been doing this for a while at CDC. But if we're really gonna meet that mission, it's gonna take doing it as a team. Um, and so the frame we've been using is protecting health as a team sport. And we've been prioritizing that collaborative approach because our goal is to accelerate impact on these important areas by bringing our teams in public health alongside teammates in healthcare, social supports, public and private sector, academia, you name it, we're interested in talking about any and all team members who can help meet the mission and help the populations that we're all trying to serve. And as you all know, working as a team means a couple of things, right? The first is we wanna make sure that we're building relationships and identifying aligned priorities with our partners. We wanna think about how we can also identify what our shared goals are so that we can share the accountability with our federal as well as our state and local partners. And today I'll be talking more about how we're tactically moving in this way by developing a set of collaborative initiatives to really model how we at CDC and public health do this work. 
And then of course, another critical component to protecting health as a team sport is also coming together to tell the story of the successes and the impact that we've had. And I'll add, as you look at these three focus areas um, on the left side of the slide, obviously these are, these are tricky, complex, hard things to tackle. And let's be honest, in areas like mental health and maternal health, we're not seeing things move in the right direction. And in these areas, there are so many different parts of our public health, our healthcare, social support, community ecosystems that need to work together to move in the right direction. And so, you know, it's in these three areas that we're quite focused on this approach of protecting health as a team sport. So on the next slide, as I mentioned, we're really moving to action and tactics here through these set of what we're calling collaborative initiatives. Um, these are existing CDC programs, policies, or data activities that can, again, really accelerate impact on major public health issues by leaning into results-based partnerships, and I'll talk more about that in a second, and increase partner engagement. Um, we really started a lot of this work when we set aligned priorities by talking with our colleagues at the federal level to say, you know, where can we showcase our joint leadership and our joint priorities to find areas that we really want to lean in together and say, we can make a difference. We can demonstrate measurable impact in the next nine to 12 months together by deciding to really, again, prioritize and lean in together. All of these collaborative initiatives that I'll be talking about today as examples have been proposed, narrowed, and refined by C the CIOs at CDC with cross-agency input. And many of them really build upon uh, collaboration that is happening across CIOs within the agency as well. And these all build upon, as you all know, met the many established partnered public health activities that have been ongoing at CDC for a long time. On the right side of this slide are just some of the icons of some of the partners um, that were identified by CIOs and that we're continuing to lean in deeply with in this work. Uh, next slide. So I know you all have heard about moving forward and uh, you're probably maybe already making this connection in your mind, but certainly these collaborative initiatives and this approach of protecting health as a team sport are aligned with multiple of the improvement areas identified through moving forward. One very obvious one is there is a section that is called results-based partnership. Um, and so the blue box at the top talks about, these are words from you know, our moving forward plan, which is about promoting results-based partnership through partner engagement and partnership best practices. And a couple of the partnership best practices that we've really been implementing um, through these collaborative initiatives are things like, again, aligning on strategic priorities. So it's not just we at CDC saying, we think that maternal health and working together to improve maternal health is an important thing. We're also identifying that with our partners, they also have identified maternal health and some of the specific strategies as a top priority for them. And it's going in addition to identifying these strategic priorities, it's getting tactical and saying, how are we going to collaborate and coordinate our efforts on a work plan? And then being very upfront about stating what are our goals and how are we gonna share accountability because we've stated these goals together. So now on the next slide, I'll go a little bit deeper into the focus area of supporting young families. Um, Cause as I mentioned, we have been identifying these collaborative initiatives within the focus areas. So when we talk about supporting young families, this is, and I'm a pediatrician. And so I love, I love all of the focus areas. I, I really love this one. Um, and it's really about prevention and prioritizing upstream as much as far upstream as we can get, because we want all kids and families to have the opportunity to thrive. Um, the way that we've talked about this some is when we are talk about the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, this is the capital P of the prevention that's actually silent when we say CDC. And so today what I'll do is I just wanna give you three different examples that really um, are great um, opportunities to describe this type of work. And also the reason in particular in supporting young families as well as mental health and in the uh, respiratory season that it's so important to work across sectors because when you think about the different parts of our public health, our healthcare, our community ecosystems that 
are touching and working with children and families to support them, there's a lot of them. And so there's a lot of opportunity to really think about what can we in public health, what's the role we can play, what's the role CDC can play specifically in helping to bring that coordination and collaboration to our efforts. Um, and that means that the federal level, as well as at the state and local levels, where there's, there are immense complexities to the way those systems work. Um, and so we're really looking to break down silos. And I just want to give a, a story really quick that I think about when we think about supporting young families, you know, families that I've seen in my clinic where you've got a single mom who's got her infant with her. I'm talking to her about tracking on developmental milestones and, hey, it would be great if you got signed up for WIC. And I know your middle schooler's not here for his well child check today, but don't forget, we talked at his last appointment, we need a therapist. He was missing a lot of school, you know, we, sh we should address those things. And what that means for real kids, real families in their life is her to-do list coming out of that visit where we're trying to do all the things to support young families. It's too long. It's asking her to navigate a bunch of systems that frankly don't work particularly well together. Um, and so I, I give that story because for any of us who have worked with kids and families, I, this, is, this is such the common occurrence as we're trying to support them. And so all of these examples I'll talk about today are really with the thought in mind of how do we make it easier and thus more likely to happen that kids and families are gonna get the supports that they need. All right, so let's go for the first example um, on the next slide. And for each of these three examples, I'll first describe what the collaborative initiative is and why it's important in this moment. And then also I really wanna highlight that shared accountability piece and how we've been talking about measuring and really driving forward that results-based partnership. So for this first initiative, which is Learn the Signs Act Early, and I see Dr. Remley right in the room here. Um, this is coming out of her center. So I think many of you all are quite aware since COVID, we've seen a really concerning rise in the number of kids who were just missing developmental milestones. And certainly this is feeding in to the youth mental health crisis and many other issues that we're seeing with children currently. So CDC has a fabulous online-based tool. It's called Learn the Signs Act Early. You can go onto your phone now and download it if you'd like. Um, and this is a tool that families or childcare or healthcare workers, or really anyone can use to help them identify developmental issues earlier. Because as you all are likely aware, the earlier ide we identify these issues and get these kids linked up to supports, the better the outcome. So to meet this moment where we know we have more young kids who are missing these milestones, we're working with partners to supercharge dissemination and use of this free, ready-to-go, evidence-based tool. It's things like working with HRSA to train up staff at our FQHCs. Uh, we're working with the Administration for Children and Families because they want to help us get this into the hands of more early care and education providers where we've had huge turnover during the pandemic, and we've just got a lot of folks who are working with kids who may not know what some of those developmental milestones at 18 months or two years might be. We're working with USDA and our local nutrition partners through WIC programs who are again, interacting with those families. So when you've got that family in front of you, they can also be sharing this really great tool that any family can be using or they themselves can be using to say, hey, you know, your kid is nine months old. Did you know this is the type of thing that they should be doing? And if they're not, why don't we get you hooked up with some services? On the right side, you can see some examples of the types of metrics um, that we've identified. And if you could go back one slide, um, that is really promoting results-based partnerships. So, you know, really measuring and sharing with our partners, we want to see an increase by 25% of use of this tool because we know that this is the type of thing that can help families and can help young children. We wanna track the number of the FQHCs we're partnering with who are using this type of tool um, over the next nine to 12 months. So next slide, um, in another example that is both supporting young families and also overlaps with that mental health focus area, we're excited to be co-leading work on expanding the implementation of positive childhood experience strategies, or also another way this is often talked about is preventing adverse childhood experiences. Um, again, I think as you all know, 
ACEs are associated with all the bad things that we don't want for kids. And the more of them they experience, the more likely it is that they have poor health outcomes. So on the left side of the slide, you can see a screenshot of a wonderful resource for action that we have at CDC. And this collaborative initiative is all about partnership so that we can bring more of the strategies that we know work that are in this resource for action to life with our partners for more kids and families. So here we're working with, again, the Administration for Children and Families and the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as the Office of the Surgeon General to prioritize of the strategies in this resource for action, we're really honing in around things like strategies that promote social connectedness for kids and families, things like parenting supports, and bringing those strategies, not just saying, hey, here's a PDF we're going to email to you, but really together deeply engaging with partners together to say, hey, we want to make sure you know, these are some of the types of things that could be brought to your community, your daycare center, you know, all the different places. And we're here to support you in putting these things into place. Um, we're leveraging existing networks and, for example, grantees across both of our agencies. We actually just met yesterday and we're sharing the list of those grantees that we think are going to be best suited to cross-share information. Um, and we're also taking advantage of this particular initiative because as we talked about shared accountability, we all recognize that there's certainly an opportunity to get even better measures on how we measure things like positive childhood experiences and social connectedness. So we're also working together to say, how can we also leverage this opportunity to get some of those measures? And we are thinking about sustainability and leveraging something that David, we talked about as we think about doing this work, right? It's with these partners, specifically, as well as leveraging enterprise-wide structures. In this case, the HHS has a Behavioral Health Coordinating Council that Dr. Auri um, is very involved in, and we're using that as a structure for also capturing some of this interagency inter collaboration and lifting up of this work. And in the final example on the next slide, I'll talk about some of our work to improve care for postpartum women Again, you all know this is a top priority. And with multiple partners at HHS and beyond, we've really identified the postpartum period as a critical opportunity, in particular for working with states and local jurisdictions. And we at CDC, with the partners listed at the bottom of the slide, have particularly honed in on hypertension as a major cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. And we have IHS and tribal partners listed because we're really also here leading with equity, which is I know another topic for discussion today, um, because we know that rates of hypertension related disorders in pregnancy are much higher in our tribal populations. And we've been working with them to listen, to say, you know, what is it? We've, we've got great things coming. Like you can see the milestone, we have a hypertension in pregnancy QI change package that's forthcoming. We're working with them to listen to say, what, it, what from this is going to be useful to you? What other things might be helpful to you all as we think about supporting AIAN um, pregnant people in their journey, as, particularly as it relates to hypertension? And again, highlighting that we've got these process metrics um, and working with folks like CMS to say, and what are the payment structures and mechanisms to support more of this kind of work where we want to bring more self-measuring or self-monitoring blood pressure cuffs into homes, because we know that that's going to help people be able to track their blood pressure and get it under control faster. So to close on the last slide, um, I've just given you today three examples of collaborative initiatives that are about supporting young families at CDC. In the supporting young family space, we also have other collaborative initiatives that cover things like childhood immunizations and school-based supports for youth behavioral health. And again, I just wanna highlight how this work is really promoting results-based partnership and our work at CDC to be part of an integrated system that protects the public's health. And this is really about building partnership as a core capability at CDC. So as we move into the discussion, I did wanna um, just say that hopefully you've seen in these examples that these initiatives are in many cases about inspiring action and bringing more public health data and best practices to life in more states and local communities. Um, and so 
would really value your thoughts on how we can most efficiently and effectively work, for example, with healthcare systems, payers, other community-based partners, who in many cases, they are the arm that will bring these things to life. Like sometimes it's our role at CDC to say, hey, these are evidence-based practices that would work. And then we need to find the partners who are in the best position to bring those things to life. So we'd love your thoughts on accelerating implementation with these partners. And then also with this esteemed group on the ACD, how can we also think about evaluating these efforts or generating more evidence on how we bring more of these to implementation, thinking about, for example, implementation science insights on these types of collaborative efforts? Wow, thanks very much, Dr. Wong. It's a really important work. We have about 20 minutes um, for discussion and would welcome uh, input on the issues that Dr. Wong highlighted or other issues. Julie. Thanks for your presentation, Charlene. That was really helpful and, and very clear. I, I love this concept and it's so nice to see CDC partnering with other federal agencies. I feel like that is an area where there's a lot of opportunity that has been unrealized in the past. So it's exciting to see this. I also can like the fact you can see that you're focusing on marginalized populations and a lot of the work by your partnership with FQHCs and also with WIC. Um, and, and so that's really important and really clear. The question I have for you relates to the accountability and your tracking because you, the metrics that you identified didn't necessarily get into tracking the uptake of the different interventions by marginalized populations. And I feel like that is, from a health equity perspective, those are the groups that really need the most support. And, and the way that we ensure that they are getting what they need is by really tracking the data by their population. So maybe you're planning to do that. I just wasn't on the slide, but just wanted to, I was just wondering, is that something that you're planning to do? Yeah, Julie, thanks so much for the question. Certainly something for some of the collaborative initiatives where those data are more readily accessible. Um, I think, as you might imagine, that is one of the challenges that we have for, for many of these types of initiatives. And again, I'll look at Dr. Remley over there with Learn the Science Act early, you know, as we are tracking, for example, use of that great online-based tool harder sometimes to be able to identify, you know, who exactly is using it. That is why we are really uh, leaning into, and, and I will just say, because all of these were proposed across CIOs, one of the fantastic things as they came in, they all were leading with equity. So, you know, working with WIC, working with FQHCs, working with the tribal partners, because we know that we need to make those very intentional efforts. But I do think the measurement piece can be more tricky for some. But this is where, for example, for some of the initiatives, we have been talking about using how, how could we leverage other data sets like Medicaid claims data, for example, when we're looking at hypertension to say, well, we do know some additional uh, sociodemographic information in those data. And how can we use those to sort of cross to see at least as a proxy where we think we're getting more of the uptake. Um, and several of these, as you saw, are very much targeted at addressing the inequities and disparities that we know exist. We can work our way around the table here. So Octavio. I'll hear it later. <laughs> Charlene, thanks for that great presentation. Love the approach with the ACEs, obviously. Uh, as you were talking about, you know, support for parents, one thing that crossed my mind, and I'm wondering if you guys have considered this, it, obviously we usually think about the parents of the children, but given the trends that have happened, especially with the opioid crisis, we've now seen a greater number of older adults, grandparents raising the kiddos, right? So ensuring that these resources are also addressing all individuals who in fact are raising the kids. And I think it's very relevant, especially for, unfortunately for rural America as well. And so it would be in, uh, important to ensure the marketing of the resources takes into consideration what it does take that sort of nuance to get to those kind of uh, types of families, structures, and especially in rural America. And just wondering if you had any uh, thoughts about that. Thanks, sorry, I got distracted by the song. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, actually, 
Karen and I are like giggling at each other because we have been talking about just that, right? The multi-generational approach to yes. how we support young families, 100% so important. I think Julie ties very much into your question as well, because when we think about the households where there are even broader multi-generational approaches, it is often in our historically marginalized populations. And so, yes, 100%. We're thinking about that. And thanks for raising that. I do think there are some of these where we could think even more deeply about um, opportunities to engage some of our other partners um, to make sure that that we're reaching those populations. Oh, excellent. And a follow uh, a, a separate question, postpartum care, super important uh, time frame when it comes to um, children and their development, but any thoughts about preconception? Talking about going upstream, I think we need to go as upstream as possible, because as you all know, as a pediatrician, yeah. the ecosystem that exists prior to even conception that then actually results in how a child's to be raised and what kind of factors are going to impact them, especially those ACEs? Just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I'll say that, you know, as we're thinking about the postpartum period, part of the reason that came up is also because we're thinking about a, a longer postpartum period. One of the discussions we've been having at HHS is to say, when we think about the policy levers and new opportunities available to us, where is there an opportunity to really go after something? We now have 37 states that have extended postpartum Medicaid coverage to 12 months. And so that's actually what we were really thinking about. Okay, like just as you all know, just giving that coverage extension isn't going to actually bring the benefit, particularly to the women who most need it. And so this work, for example, in the postpartum, it was a nice use case to say, now that so many millions of people have access to that extended coverage. It's a nice use case to move from maternal care to primary care, which for several of these folks has never been available, which will then also lead into interpregnancy spacing, preconception, right? So I think we were certainly thinking about that, you know, longer period as, as the whole spectrum really of like postpartum from this pregnancy and potentially leading into a healthier next pregnancy. But also I think certainly lots of thinking about preconception and you know again everything is about getting very far upstream that makes total sense you'll say even texas we finally got the 80th legislature to extend postpartum care through medicaid for the full 12 months after yeah it's so exciting and, and, and again it was really thinking about like so many of these right just because there's been a policy change or best practices guidance release like it's how do you bring that to life right how do you put it into action for people and so that's what we were thinking about with this one Charlene, I was uh, trying to focus on what playlist uh, Josh is curating for the AC, <laughs> so I got a little distracted myself. So thank you for walking through those three priority areas and just really excited to see how your state uh, experience is uh, infused uh, throughout all the work that you described. I, my question is um, related to the health equity work group and the recommendations that we've developed. And I know you started out by describing the different partnerships across the three agency-wide priorities. So just flipping it or inverting it, you started with public health, healthcare partners, and then community. Could you say a little bit more about two things, how equity is embedded uh, in the three agency-wide priorities that you described, um, number one. And number two, the follow-up is how you're all thinking about uh, community engagement and partnering uh, with communities in developing all the work that follows and, in, and also the measures that I think yeah. uh, Julie began to describe. Okay, so I think, um, you know, I, I came with Dr. Cohen from North Carolina where our frame there is we, we led with, we lead with equity. We all, we all lead with equity. And so certainly I think the three focus areas that have been identified, have, I be, have been identified leading with equity because in all three of these areas, we know that there are immense disparities and this work of protecting health as a team sport, as I've said, it's about bringing strategies, including those that will help start addressing those disparities so that we're not just, you know, admiring the disparities, but really working to bring things to action to address them. So I would say like in general, 100%, all of those three were identified with equity in mind. I think when uh, your second question around community engagement, and actually this is a good example that also gets at the measurement. Let me give you an example of one where um, we've really been thinking about how do we take this collaborative initiative opportunity to build a process that we can use every single year. It's related to fall winter respiratory this, uh, season. 
and it's related to our new RSV immunization products um, that are to protect infants, which as you all know, RSV, leading cause of hospitalization for babies, and our American Indian Alaska native babies have a rate of hospitalization four to 10 times higher. And thus there's also a unique recommendation for them for nirsevimab, the infant um, immunization. One of the things that we're now, this is one of our collaborative initiatives that we've been working with AAP and tribal partners and a variety of other folks on, CMS as well to get the right coverage is we're actually just now kicking off a process that can be a yearly thing where as we get through this respiratory season, we're gonna start right after with listening sessions and we've identified the tribal partners who are gonna help us to you know, find the folks who we wanna to listen to to say, okay, we just came out of this respiratory season. What went well? What didn't work? What's needed? What, what sorts of questions were you getting from the community? What sort of misinformation were you hearing from the community? We do that early in the calendar year. Then we take the next couple of months to together very deliberately and with time so that we're not rushing, do the work to align on what's our messaging for the next season? What sort of resources do we need to develop together so that we're really lined up by the early summer so that when we need to launch the next season of support and communications, those pieces are in place. So, you know, that's just an example. And then Julie, to your question, that is one where we've also been looking at, and we do have some of the sociodemographic data so that we can see immunization rates by different regions and sociodemographic groups and really working as, as part of our data modernization work to get even more granular and what we can see and how quickly we can see and visualize those data. So that's, that's one example. I, I appreciate the question. I think there are others in which we can think about again, sort of more deeply doing community listening. But I think this is a very nice example that we're just kicking off now, actually. So I definitely think, that, thank you. And uh, also um, probably on your radar, but in terms of partnerships with other agencies uh, through HRSA and the Healthy Start initiatives, I know when I was at the city uh, in Boston, we had a very active, and Julie's nodding to in Chicago, a community advisory board. And so- yeah not having to reinvent the wheel, yes. appreciate that, and just leveraging and activating uh, those community advisory boards and others. Um, yes, and I should have mentioned, Leandris actually is part of our work to develop. these. actually presented on some of the groups, the office, oh, there she is. Her team presented on some of the, to make sure all the CIOs that are leading these initiatives are aware of some of those groups exactly, and to make sure that over the year, we, we will want to be bringing some of these to them, yeah, use it, leveraging existing groups, and even for this tribal work we're working with like Otasa and also some of our sister agencies that have some of these groups established where we're going to be bringing these to them yeah exactly thank you well I think Monica and I think very much a lot because I was going to ask a similar question but I will just um, uh, quickly make a comment I'm, I'm delighted to see your three focus areas delighted to hear about your approach your holistic approach and looking at the um, community ecosystem I, one of the things that struck me, though, um, in terms of partnerships, as we think about mistrust, distrust, and you're going to be operating in critical areas, I think, where that is um, rampant among different groups, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's racial and ethnic minoritized um, groups and so forth, um, I didn't see any organizations that have the trust of some of these communities. So from the NAACP to others uh, who have been in the trenches, uh, advancing health equity. So I just want to get a sense of how you all intend to include groups that represent um, these racial and ethnic minority or people with disabilities and other groups. Yeah, that's such a great question. I think certainly in our work where we're focused on, for example, our American Indian Alaska Native, I think more of that is built in currently. Um, let me take that back to the teams, because I think I know certainly some of the partners we're working with, it's all about leveraging each other's networks. So for example, in our work around ACEs, part of what the work has been in this, these lists we just exchanged with each other yesterday, they are very local community-based groups that do have that trust. And so, you know, we're talking, and many of the icons are of federal and national organizations everything that I talked about today, all of that is actually getting effectuated at the state and local levels. And so really working through, in many cases, grantees who are the folks who have those trusted relationships. But I think it's a great, again, a, a great thing to bring back as we really think about the implementation support on these and making sure that we're really being quite intentional that we have in fact engaged those right groups. Thank you, Dr. Wong. 
今日。There were two pieces of information that came out very recently, and one is the decrease in childhood vaccinations. Second one, in massive increase in homeschooling. Uh -huh. I mean, it feels like those are two things that are going to be a public health crisis really, really soon. Um, you know, homes, the increase in homeschooling is, is going to you know that they won't meet the the top the school needs for that session and and i'm just interested to know with your community engagement with your engagement in tribal communities the messaging that we're using yeah you know something came up at dinner last night about um vaccination and and are people um objecting to the vaccine or are they objecting to the mandate and it's, it's just something that I think we need to include in our discussions because, I mean, in terms of healthy families, the vaccination, not just for the kids, but for the, for the parents, I mean, this is such a huge area that, that we need to get our heads around. And just what do you think? <laughs> so, so many things, thinking so many things. But um, so one of the collaborative initiatives that I did not talk in more detail about today, we actually have one that is on catch up vaccination for children and their routine vaccinations, because it is a huge issue. And I think as you raise with the increase in homeschool, I mean, and even the number of yeah exemptions that just came out, you know, it's, it's alarming. Um, so we do have a wonderful campaign that is at the center of this collaborative initiative. It's called Let's Rise. Perhaps some of you all have seen it. It's all about partnerships with healthcare providers, with education. I do think, uh, you know, Dan, we should really be looking at, you know, making sure we've got those other groups as well that are reaching out. And, and it's a it's an um, initiative and campaign that I'm still learning a little bit more about, but just to say that in and of itself is recognized as a major public health issue is at the center of one of our um, collaborative initiatives. Um, I just want to also highlight a little adjacent to your question, but just for your awareness, um, I don't know if it'll come up in this meeting, but as we think about schools and the many challenges we've seen there, another one of our initiatives is school-based behavioral health supports, because we also know that kids who feel connected at schools, it's such a protective factor and also likely to keep them in school if they are in fact feeling connected in school. And then in addition to that, you all may be aware that we have recently launched our newly merged um, Division of Adolescent and School Health within the Chronic Center. And so also leveraging that as an opportunity to really look at our strategic priorities as it relates to our work to support health and children in schools, um, both physical and behavioral health. So um, two, well, one meta comment and one meta question for you, Charlene. Um, the comment is that um, I really appreciate how um, in this set of initiatives, you are saying it's not just about what CDC does directly, but CDC can focus on a goal and bring people around it. And I think certainly initially having you and the director behind these um, demonstrates the authority that CDC can have, even for things not under its direct control, as a kind of coordinating and leadership force. And it's like state and local health departments, sometimes they're discrete programs that are run, like you may run a home visiting program, but that's different from saying, let's get people together to lower infant mortality or, you know, achieve a public health outcome. And I think it's great for CDC to be doing that. And that leads me to my question, which is, as you think about that, um, are you thinking about the, the structure that you need for a successful intervention so that um, it can be replicated across other issues and perhaps eventually across the agency so that it can adopt this for, for other things where it can, you know, different parts of the agency. Maybe there's a part of the agency that's running a grant program for something now, but ultimately it really needs to be thinking about the outcome and working with partners in order to achieve it. Yeah, um, Josh, thank you so much for the question. So yes, uh, definitely thinking about, you know, what 
sustainable structures are needed. And particularly because this is so aligned with moving forward in results-based partnership, we're really leveraging work that's been ongoing. So I'll give you some concrete examples. As we are thinking about that results piece and that shared accountability, we're lining up the way that we're measuring and this reporting is happening with the performance management framework that is being put into place as part of the work of moving forward. Also, a big part of all of this, as you all know, is building and sustaining relationships, following up <laughs> um, you know, with the actions needed, making sure that we're coordinated across CDC if we're all reaching out to CMS and asking them all to do different things or pay for different things with us. Uh, so one of the things, for example, that's a infrastructure piece that's being built as part of moving forward is a um, consumer a CRM, a, basically an online tool to be able to track, you know, which partners are we working with, who's working with them. And so like those types of pieces that are part of the sustainable structure. And then I do think we're also working with teams, particularly in the Office of Policy Performance and Evaluation, OPPE, um, to really think about like Monica's, we're developing some of those processes like we just talked about and with Leandris's Office of Health Equity to really think about how do we document some of that process so that it's more plug and play that across different types of topic areas. So 100% um, things we're thinking of and that we're sort of now getting into the phase where we're really like starting to implement and build those things. So thanks for the question. Thanks for a second chance here too. I wanted to build on Monica and Daniel's comments because I think especially and, and, and also on Jill's because the childhood immunization is another area where I think this concept of partnering with community is going to be essential. And I think if we didn't, if we don't take advantage of the lessons that we learned through COVID in terms of the power and the impact that in partnership with trusted sources of information, trusted community organizations at the national level or at the state or local level, in terms of the ability to actually decrease the health inequities and disparities, I think we will really have lost an opportunity. And so I, I just, I feel like I have to say that again because you guys said it, but I feel so strongly that this is critical. It, it should be, as you're looking at these kind of partnerships with federal agencies and other national organizations, also not forgetting about community because community is so important. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And I, like I said, this is one that I'm still learning a little bit more about, but I am quite sure that that is already built in. And I think for, from all of your comments, we're really gonna take another look at all of these to think about again, where could we potentially deepen? Thanks, Charlene. And I also want to acknowledge that I think you told us at dinner that you've only been here two months. Is that right? I think maybe like four. Four <laughs> months. <laughs> so thank That's you. Like on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> just very quickly, I know we're we're going to go just a couple of minutes over. Um, great questions. And I just wanted to um, put one more thought in, particularly relative to your request to us to think about how this all comes together at the front lines. And you had a really nice story about thinking about it as a provider. One of the things you've identified, which is absolutely true, is that there's fragmentation uh, at the federal level, a siloing of some of this, and you're certainly working to break that down. And as you know, but I need to ask the question, at the frontline level in delivering services, there's also fragmentation and siloing across all these different interventions when it's actually the same individual, the same mom, the same kid that needs to benefit multiply across all of these. So I'm wondering, have you had a chance yet to think about what you, CDC, the federal government might do to actually help integrate the thinking about the range of these interventions you're talking about so that those frontline community-based organizations or community health workers or providers can more quickly identify and assure across all these interventions that the ones that are most important are the ones that are actually getting delivered? So yes, thinking and appreciate you all's help in thinking because obviously it's it's incredibly complex and tricky. I'll give uh, two two thoughts on that. I think one is that certainly in healthcare and other sectors things follow the money, <laughs> um, and so one area that we have been working with and a federal partner that we've been working closely with is CMS as we think about you know what are the payment structures to bring public health, healthcare closer together, and how can the payment structure support more of that, um, I think is one area. I'll give one example where it's, it is, to your question, I think what you just asked, which is 
we have limited intervention resources. We wanna make sure that we're matching the limited and right intervention resources in the right places and for the right people. Um, one of the collaborative initiatives that I didn't talk about today, it's in the mental health and overdose space is, is in the overdose and overdose data to action space. And so we're working with SAMHSA to say, you know, we at CDC help support incredible public health data and best practices as it's related to overdose in the overdose data to action program, dollars going to states and local jurisdictions. SAMHSA does the same thing. They fund states and local jurisdictions with treatment like naloxone and MAT. In some cases, it's happened organically. They've put those dot, they've connected those dots at the state or local level, and they bring those data and those resources together. So they're bringing those limited resources to the right places or best places. Um, we're working with SAMHSA to say, what can we do together so that it's not crossing our fingers and hoping that that organically happens at the local level. Um, instead, we're doing collaborative work, collaborative TA with our state and local grantees so that uh, that type of dot connecting, we're helping drive that um, so that we're doing more of that matching. Um, but again, David, such a great question. I think these are like pieces of it, but when you think about like the fuller spectrum and how all those different pieces from public health and healthcare and SDOH all come together and how you prioritize, you know, I think all things still being worked on. Um, and certainly we hope through this work in the protecting health as a team sport and these collaborative initiatives, it helps us build processes, muscles, tools so that we can continue to further the work, the work to get there. Thanks very much. Thanks also for taking the time with the committee today for that great uh, stimulating presentation. Really, we really, really appreciate it. We have a really, I think, interesting and important session now and a great person presenting it. So I'd like to introduce, although she needs no introduction, Sherry Berger, who's gonna be talking to us about um, some of the decisions that have been had to made on what programs have been affected as the COVID supplemental funding uh, resources have declined. And so you are on. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you I haven't met, although I think I've met everybody at some point in my life, I'm Sherry Berger. Um, I uh, currently serve as a senior counselor. I've been at CDC for um, just over 27 years, and I have uh, one month left, and I will be departing the agency. So um, I was given the privilege to talk about my favorite uh, <laughs> subject here at CDC, which is the budget. Um, I worked on the federal appropriations process for many years before serving as the chief operating officer. Um, I tend to speak too quickly when it comes to budget because this stuff Believe is- Believe it or not, a little soft too, if you could okay. move the microphone. Oh, closer. I've never been told I'm too quiet, so that's good. Okay, um, well, why don't we go ahead? We'll go through the slides um, and then do we do questions at the end? Is that how we do this? Wonderful. Okay, so I was asked to talk about the COVID rescission, which is really driven by something called the Fiscal Responsibility Act or the FRA, not to be confused with the IRA that was passed the year before. This bill did result in a rescission or a returning of COVID supplemental funding from CDC. Of course, it was across the federal government, but I'm only gonna talk about the funds that were provided to CDC. So one question that David and I discussed uh, when we were going through these slides is, um, no, these funds did not address what had already been obligated. So if a state or local health department, a public health partner had money in hand, even if they had not yet spent that money, meaning they hadn't actually used it, those dollars were not rescinded. What was rescinded is money, I would say, sitting at the government bank that had not yet been obligated. All of these dollars had plans, they just hadn't all been obligated. So in some instances, it might've been a multi-year grant program. And we were putting out, I don't know, let's just say hypothetically, $200 million a year for a disease intervention specialist program uh, for tracking down STD cases to improve our workforce for contact tracing. So maybe we had a chance to award the first three years and we had not yet awarded the second two years. Those are the kinds of dollars that were rescinded. Um, the other thing this bill did that's not nothing to do with COVID, it actually put spending caps in place for the federal appropriations process. And I'll talk for a second about that at the very end. Next slide, please. Okay, so how much money came to CDC? So CDC received two um, sort of buckets, if you will, of COVID supplemental dollars. The first was Congress saying this money will go to CDC4, and that was just about $27 billion. The second bucket was money that went to HHS, and it was either for public health workforce 
or it was for something called testing and mitigation. Um, those were the two really big buckets of money that resulted in about $55 billion intended to come to CDC to be obligated over a couple of years. Next slide, please. Um, in case you need it, and you probably have access to the slides, I did give you all of the details of each of the bills and how much money came direct or through HHS for all of the COVID supplementals. I will not read the list to you, but you have um, access to it if you need it. Next slide, please. Okay, so what were the impacts? Um, what Congress did in the FRA was rescinded buckets of money from CDC, basically said uh, balances for these following lines will be returned to uh, the U.S. Treasury. The first bucket was vaccine distribution and related activities, and these are the labels that Congress uses. The second bucket was for vaccine confidence, and the third bucket was for our global health activities. The good news was that a lot of our um, other key priority areas like data modernization and genomic sequencing really at the end of the day were not impacted because so much of that money had already been obligated or was in a pipeline or Congress recognized that work was always intended to be multi-year money for building infrastructure, so those dollars were not rescinded. Next slide, please. So here at CDC, uh, this was the approach that we took once we received the final word, um, which was we, we had to make some tough decisions. We had to go back through all of our approved spend plans and figure out what needed to be stopped completely, where we might be able to do some of the work, but not all of it, and where we were able to potentially use other COVID dollars or base resources to continue our commitment. And that process took longer, I think, than many of our jurisdictions and partners had hoped. I think they expected we were going to have answers overnight, um, and they had been waiting for months for answers. But we did work through this process. It does take time. And just like everything else at CDC, um, we work through the administration. So spend plans are drafted at CDC. They go through HHS and are finally delivered to the White House. Office of Management and Budget um, before we're able to execute on those dollars. So that process does take some time. Next slide, please. Um, these are examples of programs that either ended completely due to a lack of funding like the disease intervention specialists or we had to scale them back um, like the Public Health AmeriCorps. So I provided a list of these programs for you. I could explain a little bit about what some of them are. I think you'd probably be most familiar with the first bullet because that was in the press. Um, the money that was to go to the jurisdictions to modernize, not to run these systems, but to modernize the systems was rescinded. The next two bullets are really about outreach and education about vaccines um, to increase um, vaccination rates and to address um, some of our challenges around equity, and those dollars were rescinded. The next couple of bullets were really about our work overseas, building the capacity to do better surveillance and early detection of COVID around the world. Disease intervention specialists we talked about. The laboratory data exchange program is really as exactly what it says. It's about improving our ability to get lab data from um, jurisdictions and labs around the country. And then Public Health AmeriCorps, which is near and dear to my heart, we were able to start with COVID dollars. Um, but unfortunately, after next year, there'll be no more funding for that program. Next slide, please. Okay, and, and this, I, I don't want you to worry too much about the numbers because they're gonna change, but the bottom line here is that FRA did not just impact COVID, but it put spending caps in place. And we have already seen the house come out with its FY24 mark for CDC and it's not great. Um, the house mark was obviously much better and there'll be a couple of weeks, if not months of work. And, um, you know, I, huh? House came out. It was not great. Sorry, did I say house? I keep going. House mark was not great. Senate was better. We are under a continuing resolution on maybe the uh, CR will be extended a few more times before there's finally a negotiation between the House and Senate, but they are very far off in the bill that we sit in, which is the labor HHS and education bill, they are very far off. So it's gonna take some time. Our bill is typically one of the most controversial and it looks like they're gonna try to take some of the easier bills off the table and resolve those sooner. And I think ours will probably be closer to the end of the batch. So good, 
Okay, I tried to do that as simple as possible. And that is the last slide and we can, yes, I wanted to leave room for discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Great presentation as always. Um, open for discussion, questions, comment. And while people are thinking, um, I guess I'd like to ask, you know, COVID did result in a fair amount of resource, both coming to CDC and to state and local health departments. And as a result, they were able to do new things. Sometimes in a budget cutting environment, when dollars go away, it's sort of last in, first out. Um, and arguably for many of the uh, interventions in COVID, for example, in health equity, many of those may represent priorities going forward. So, so what can CDC do? And is there anything the ACD can do to, to uh, enable as budgets are reduced, the perspective that let's look at what's most important to keep, not what was the last thing that we put in the yeah. first thing to go out. I think that's great. And I think you might get five different answers to that question if you ask five different people. So I'll provide my personal perspective, which very much matches the appropriation strategy that we've been taking over the past couple of years, which is where can we invest in public health infrastructure that will lift up all of public health? So for me, that is workforce, that is data, that is lab capacity, that is readiness and response, and that is the global health portfolio. And I think the same holds true with the COVID investments that we've been able to make. So we have $3 billion that went out to state and local jurisdictions in a grant to about 110 recipients for a public health workforce. It is important to continue to learn from those experiences, to hear the successes of those programs from the jurisdictions directly, because at some point that money will be running out. And our hope is that we can educate members of Congress about the value that that program added to their public health infrastructure in their own state or local jurisdiction so that they will want to continue that. And the same holds true for readiness and response for laboratory capacity, and especially for data, which um, if you look at the projections and the work that Jen Layden has done, I mean, we're looking at a 10 to $12 billion need for data modernization over a five-year period. We are able to chip away with that at that with the one-time COVID supplemental, but we need to articulate what we were able to accomplish in a very short time so that Congress sees the value of this money and wants to make investments even during tight times. This is a shy group today. Um, I'll do one more and then uh, we'll see if we have questions, but this may be unanswerable, but it's a sort of sort of frustration that that I have, and it has to do. You use the data modernization example, with the need for long term investment, in order to make that happen. Oftentimes, particularly sitting at the state and local level, the request is, well, in order to make investment, we need permanent funding. We can't use one time funding to make an investment. Yet we live in a federal system that doesn't provide permanent funding. So. Um, on your way out the door, what, what creative ideas do you have for resolving that inherent tension? Yeah. I mean, I, if, if I were given a blank slate and the opportunity to solve this problem, I think this particular challenge is not going to be solved with discretionary funds. It, it's impossible to, to get what we, what $12 billion in discretionary funds over five years. So if I were queen for a day, I would be looking at something like mandatory funding source because this problem is not going away. And when you look at an individual hospital system that invests what billions of dollars just on EHRs, I mean, we haven't made that investment here in the public health infrastructure yet. And I think that will lift all of public health and I don't know how it's gonna be fixed with discretionary money not in the spending cap, you know, world that we live in today. So that's that's my creative solution, but I'm not sure Congress would agree with that. Well, be sure to tell them that before you leave. Okay. Or um, maybe it'll be easier for me to tell them after yeah, I leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll start around this way, Joel. Yes. This one's going to be hard. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up on that point about, you know, one of the challenges is that there's an issue of the moment and then the funding comes in yeah. for that. Like, if you, I mean, COVID being obviously an enormous one and a lot of funding coming to CDC and then suddenly it goes away. Is there, you know, do you have any perspective on how those mini surges of funding can be used to build 
overall capacity or is that like a fool's errand to think of it that way? I mean, I think I'd probably ask the jurisdictions, but I think it's, you know, because at the end of the day, that's where the bulk of the resources are going. I think inside CDC, there are infrastructure investments that are needed. So it's not completely a fool's errand. And I think there is an opportunity, for example, moving from on-prem to the cloud. I mean, there are infrastructure investments that are one, one time, maybe they take three years to get there. It's not completely outside of the realm of possibility, but I think memories are short. You're right. I'm super, you know, sad to see things like Public Health AmeriCorps go away when I thought this was sort of the future of the public health workforce pipeline. I think there's a gap in understanding what public health is. There always has been. There isn't the same level of advocacy that exists in other parts of the government. And I think if we could bring together the various, you know, and, and we have so much, you know, competition within public health about what's most important rather than, again, this idea of focusing on the infrastructure, the capacity to build data, to build a workforce that will benefit everybody. If we can just coalesce and, and get that message, but we need champions again. It's been years since we've had some champions on the Hill. I know it's a tough time. I don't think, you know, we're going to get a lot right now. I think we need to get through a little bit more before we get there, but I think we need to educate people and public health sometimes is just misunderstood by certain parties as to what we're trying to achieve. Just before we go on, Rachel, welcome. I'm sorry I didn't see that you had arrived before. I want to uh, welcome Rachel Harden to the committee and would you mind just declaring any conflict of interest? Um, I am Dr. Rachel Hardiman with the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and I don't have any um, disclosures at this point. Thanks. Monica. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry, for uh, sharing those updates. Um, you know, on the beginning slide, you, you talked at a high level about some of the funding that will be returned. And it struck me that vaccine distribution and vaccine competence is the yeah. bulk of it, almost yeah. a billion dollars right there. And when I think about even the comments that you've shared about public health infrastructure, some of us around the table have been in conversations outside of the ACD debating and reflecting on, is it public health? I'm looking at Julie. Is it public health? Is it public health or is it the public's health? Right. And if you could indulge me, because then this is related to uh, conversations earlier about uh, vaccine uptake generally being uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, for children's yes. pediatric vaccines, and this challenge, not just for CDC, but for the field around rebuilding, if we even had it, the yeah. trust of yeah. the public and really addressing the public's health. And so I wonder, not knowing how the agency sort of, uh, how do you respond when you're having to return this large, and maybe it's not a large tranche of funding for CDC, how to mitigate the negative impacts and how to mitigate what will be even more barriers in terms of the work that you as an agency and yeah. our public health departments in collaboration with communities. Uh, how do you go about that? Um, so I, I was, if you could just say right. what you're able to say and share. Really good questions and super complicated and I will not pretend to have all the answers. I can give you my perspective on a couple of things and I, I, they feel interrelated and I, I think they are right now, but um, the um, let's start with just public health and understanding it, the, the term public health, you're absolutely right, I think is um, complicated for some people to understand and I have been in circles and heard through the years it sounds like you're just creating healthcare for poor people, right? So we have a lot of education to do on both sides of the aisle of what we mean by public health. And to your point, is it public's health? And, and that's why when we talk about public health, we try to talk about health security as another way of framing public health for certain audiences, because that's ideally what we're doing is protecting and, and, and not the Anyhow, I'll just stop there. So the second part of it, um, I think you all probably received the YLE email, but today um, Caitlin was highlighting the decrease in immunization rates right now, which is a huge problem in this country, particularly for children. And one of the things that we did during COVID, there are many successes, but one of them was building an immunization infrastructure for adults in this country. And if you're not already familiar, CDC is proposing something called vaccines for adults. And if you don't know about that, I hope 
I hope you can read and learn about it and, and talk about it with your constituents, because I would hate to see the infrastructure that was built through this process to basically disappear. And the next time we need to have this, because there will be a next time, and we all know that, that we have to start from scratch again. So it doesn't resolve the equity issues. It doesn't address all of the concerns, but um, it certainly helps have an ability for those adults who want to be immunized to have access to vaccines. The last piece that you mentioned is trust, and it's trust in CDC, it's trust in public health, it's trust in the government right now. And it's, I would say, the top thing that our director is speaking about. So I'm going to let her answer that question in her remarks, because she's much more eloquent at that than I am. So. so thanks so much for your presentation. And I'll make this quick. I don't have a question, more just a um, comment. I, I I think there's nothing like a budget crisis to really force you to look at inefficiencies or uh, ways to become more efficient. And I look at your the setup that you have with the Office of uh, Laboratory Science and Safety, and now also the uh, office. Oh, you covered up uh, Jen's title. I don't. I can't remember the office. It's Office of Public Health Data and Surveillance. Surveillance and, and technology. And technology. That those overarching offices really have the ability to look across the or agency to see what inefficiencies there actually are. So it may require investment up front in terms of doing an assessment and, and defining what the That's redundancies right. are. But I feel like this is the opportunity to really seize and, and to move forward with reducing those inefficiencies. So the systems are more are, are less expensive and more efficient and more effective. So just a comment. Thank you. Those are those are great suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Sherry. And thanks for Thank your years you. of service to this agency. We're going to miss you. OK. Well, it's my pleasure and privilege now to welcome Dr. Mandy Cohen, who's CDC still somewhat new uh, director, to her first in-person meeting at this advisory committee. Um, a, short, a short story by me. Uh, I live on Bainbridge Island in Washington, and we have lousy cell phone service there. So we're one of the few households in this country that still has a dedicated landline to use when the cell phone service goes out. A couple of months ago, back in July, um, my landline rang, and because approximately all of the calls that we get on it are robocalls asking for money, as usual, I just ignored it. Uh, about an hour and a half later, my wife, Erin, stopped up in my office and said, oh, I just checked the phone messages on our landline, and by the way, the new director of CDC called, and she said she just wanted to say hi, and if you had an opportunity uh, to call her back, she'd love to talk with you. So I did have an opportunity to call her back. I called and uh, within two rings, uh, Andy answered the phone and we proceeded to have a just great conversation uh, to get to know each other a little bit, uh, for me to hear about her first bit of time in the office and some of her priorities. And I know that you've reached out to many of the other members of this committee to do exactly the same thing. And just wanted to say, um, speaking on all our behalf, that so we've come away impressed that your smarts and your passion, but also the priority that you give to people and relationships. So I could spend a lot more time with an introduction, but I'm not going to because we wanna hear from you. So let me briefly just say that Dr. Bandy Cohen is an internal medicine physician, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and she brings to this job critical leadership skills and experience in the federal government, at the state public health level, in the private sector, and also brings critically important lived experience, including being a mother of two, um, who I think are daughters and now are the great ages of nine and 11, if I'm, if I'm right. So welcome, Dr. Cohen, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fleming. That was very kind. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today, but also to get to know you. And I wanna thank right off the bat, um, the advisory committee, I think you've been doing incredibly important work that has shaped, and I hope you are hearing over the course of this day, how it has shaped the work that we are doing on lab, on data, on equity. Um, and I wanna talk about more work that we can uh, do together, but let me start with a few thank yous. I have to thank Dr. Howery, who is sitting um, here with me. She has been my teacher since I have come here. She is, has helped me uh, navigate and learn quickly, uh, and I know that she works closely with you, so I hope you know that um, when you're when you're chatting with her, almost immediately we have a conversation about it because my schedule looks challenging. Um, and I, I, I really appreciate Deb's uh, leadership. Um, 
and an ongoing partnership as, as we, we do this work. I also wanted to welcome Andy Freishad as a new deputy. Um, it is a new position for the CDC, and I think it is um, emblematic of some of the work that we're doing on uh, consult to, to Julie's point on how do we think about leveraging work that's going on across and, and invest in some core functions that can make us more efficient. But our first deputy um, for policy legislation and comms together that I think is going to um, make the agency stronger. And we were so lucky to bring Andy back to her home where she belongs at CDC. Silly FDA doesn't doesn't need her. Um, and so we're so grateful that she has. And of course, we have all a, a, no, a ton of other leaders around. You heard from Charlene. I see Jono is here. Howard in the global space. My chief of staff, Kate. Okay, now, and of course, um, to thank Sherry. We're having a celebration for her tomorrow in 28 years of service. Uh, this, uh, the CDC would not be where it is without Sherry's leadership um, and tenacity. And I'll get to say a bunch more things tomorrow. So grateful for everyone. Okay. So uh, let me start um, with a few reflections from my first, I think almost now five months as director. I, one is to start with my with a recognition of the immense amount of work <laughs> that CDC has going, the breadth and depth of the work is just incredible. Um, the mission is incredible, of course, that guides us in terms of protecting the health of this country and really the world. Um, but that what that entails in terms of the breadth and depth is immense. And I would say I see talent all over the agency um, doing such incredible work, whether it's responding to viral hemorrhagic fever or teaming up with our uh, state and local health departments, um, or it's preventing maternal mortality. Uh, it's, it's incredible how much we have to do, but also the expertise that I see across the, the agency that, that is it's incredible. Second is we have incredible teammates um, outside the CDC um, that um, I've been, that's so why my calendar is so punishing. I have been to a, a many, many, many states already and localities, um, most of them focused on talking about getting ready or and now being in our winter respiratory virus season, talking about the importance of vaccines. I've been to California, to Massachusetts and everywhere in between. Tech, um, I'm off to Texas in a couple of days, right? So I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm meeting with folks and hearing from them to your point, David, about I do value relationships and showing up in person really helps you know know and see folks differently. And it's, it is, there's just so many great things happening on the ground around the country. And then I also took my first international trip just two weeks ago to um, Brazil. Howard and I were there uh, together. Um, and I saw the importance of our global work uh, really shine through in those moments and the power of those international relationships. We did everything from tour um, manuf vaccine manufacturing facilities to talk about Brazil's $2 billion investment they're going to make in their lab capacity, um, which we can both help them with lessons learned um, and thank you lab lab subcommittee, um, but also what can we learn from them as they make those investments? Um, so it was a really good, great opportunity. And then maybe the third reflection is, you know, that I am really proud to see this team uh, come out of a historic pandemic, learn some really hard and important lessons, and really embed it into the work. Um, moving forward was definitely the right track and the right start for the organization, and I, I definitely think the reorganization is going to make us a a uh, stronger and more effective agency. But moving forward is really more about more than moving boxes. It was really about um, thinking about, again, how do we embed those lessons learned and focusing on rapid communication of scientific information, working as one team. Those are things that are still underway. And again, back to Julie's point of how do we invest in those core capabilities to make us stronger? But um, I see the team doing that every day. So I'm really, really proud. Um, you know, look, we are in unprecedented times with more and more health threats, um, both here at our doorstep and on the horizon. But we also are in unprecedented times of scientific innovation and breakthrough. Um, it's just, we've never had the kinds of tools that we have right now 
to address these health threats, whether it's more vaccines, more treatments, more detection platforms, um, more diagnostic capability, the AI um, breakthroughs, I think are gonna be incredibly game-changing for us. So yes, a lot of threats, but a lot of opportunity. And you know, we are trying to use the response to the fall, winter respiratory virus season to embed some of those, you know, key lessons learned. And again, I, I bring them from my time in North Carolina um, and, and learning there. So one, I hope you see us already um, as an agency being more transparent in what we are doing, um, both the timeliness and accessibility of communications. We are really trying to change that and even how we are bringing together data. So COVID doesn't live somewhere separate than flu, but you're actually seeing COVID, flu, and RSV together in a harmonized way with guidance across all three, with rapid communication about changes to these viruses and, um, and other ways. And when we saw that early variant that, that looked worrisome back in August, I think we were able to communicate effectively to say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's what we're working on, and then, you know, improve that communication cycle. Second, I see the team really focusing on operational excellence. Um, and that is, when what I mean by that is not just saying, hey, here's a recommendation for vaccine, but actually making sure to hold ourselves accountable for getting folks vaccinated. And that means breaking down barriers to from everything from educational barriers to literal distance barriers to cost barriers to make sure that vaccine can be accessible as possible. The team stood up the bridge program in record time. I can't tell you what an enormous program that is and how fast they stood that up and how it is operating with success across the country to give folks access to, uh, to no cost vaccines um, with pharmacy partners. And again, that partnership being so important, but hugely important. And I, and Sherry brought up the vaccines for adults program. Again, something that's been in our budget, something I talk about with members of Congress. It's our way to extend what the bridge program is doing, but that focus on operational excellence has been um, really uh, great, but we have more, more work to do there. And then the last, so if it's transparency, operational excellence, the last for me is about building relationships. It goes back to that, um, David. So I was really um, uh, heartened to see that, you know, one place where we I really saw that partnership at work for our um, winter season is I think, you know, we have a new vaccine or immunization for young babies, nirsevimab, on long-acting monoclonal. When that came onto the market, we didn't have a billing code for pediatricians to use for to actually deliver it to get paid. And our team not only worked with AMA and AAP and others to get that code and then to CMS and for them to adopt it, they got a code for it to include counseling as well, because we knew this is gonna be important to talk folks through what this was. So it's that kind of enablement, right? That intersection between operational excellence, the scientific recommendations, and then that partnership piece, I think was really outstanding um, work. Um, so as I think about us moving into the future, we've been focused on three areas. One I've been talking a lot about, which is um, making sure we're identifying and responding to health threats, the winter virus season being the very most near-term thing that we've been focused on. But we've also focused on two other areas. One of them is um, making sure that we are focused on improving mental health and, and addressing the overdose crisis. I think this is where I want to, again, back to uh, Dr. Howery's amazing work that CDC has been contributing data and expertise and best practices in this space for quite some time, and we want to even accelerate that further. Um, and so really been pleased on, on all that work. And then third, focusing on supporting young families. Um, so thinking about how and you heard about some of this uh, work from Dr. Wong earlier today, so I won't go through it again, but I could really use your help as we think about uh, those three areas of focus, both the responding and uh, and detecting disease threats. So right now we need more folks getting vaccinated. And I, I will just say, I think we, we could use all voices to articulate um, good information to combat 
the misinformation that is out there to break through a lot of noise. It's just a lot going on in the world. Um, so beyond even misinformation, folks are just busy. Um, and we know that that they are there's vaccine fatigue out there. So how do we work together to break through that? And then as you think about these other two collaborative initiatives, thinking about how could we work together on furthering the work that CDC is doing with data best practices um, and, and the collaboration. Um, so I look forward to uh, your thoughts there. You know, Deb and I have been talking about a potential working group uh, for you all to consider, and I wanna get your feedback on this. Um, we started with, and I started my very first all staff meeting with this concept, which is about building trust. Again, I think it is foundational. Um, and I wondered if there was a work group around building trust that focused on communication and partner engagement. Um, that might be something that you all could help us think about in the context potentially of these areas of focus or broader. Um, I think the health equity work group um, very much, uh, you know, highlighted for us the importance of partnership with community organizations. I will say that was a very important um, partner for me when I was at the state level. What are the ways in which CDC can be a better partner to community organizations as we think about um, uh, making sure we have equity in all policies? So between the trust building needed on the communication side with, with misinformation and vaccine fatigue and the partner engagement piece and really figuring out how we further our equity work with community organizations. That might be one way to think about a, a further work group to help us think about that, that, that work because it is a, um, it would be a new space for, or newer space for us to uh, uh, build some more muscle for the organization. Um, so, welcome thoughts on, on that. And so why don't I stop there and welcome conversation. Thanks very much. Um, a great start and a lot of food for thought there. And you're about to find out that this is not a shy group. Great, great. Um, and so if the floor is open for um, both questions on uh, Annie's presentation, but also thoughts on future directions of this ACD, both that may be in the areas that she's identified as well as others. And we'll go to Josh first. <laughs> I'll jump in, Dr. Cohen, congratulations. It's great to see you and thanks so much for those, so. those great remarks. One, one of the many things that you bring to this job is tremendous experience on the healthcare side, in addition to your tremendous experience on the public health side. And um, with respect to trust, one of the key partners for public health are physicians in the medical system mm -hmm. because patients may trust their physicians or mm -hmm. to say more generally their clinicians, nurse practitioners, others. Um, in addition, on some of the priorities that you mentioned, there are opportunities for mm -hmm. collaboration with the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. You know, one that has been of particular interest to me is just the fact that even now, despite enormous amounts of evidence, there are many emergency departments that don't offer effective opioid use disorder treatment, mm -hmm. you know, for people who are at incredibly high risk, you know, despite the fact that it offers an enormous decline in mortality and there are randomized controlled trials and there's, you know, recommendations from every organization you could possibly imagine, there's still an enormous amount of stigma yeah. and people don't do it. And I, I just um, wonder, historically, kind of like in a way, FDA always said, you know, it, it, doesn't get involved with the practice of medicine. That's sort of an FDA statement. Um, CDC has historically stayed on one side of the line for medicine. I, I just wonder how you are thinking about that leading the agency. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. Sharfstein for bringing that up. And we have very much been talking about protecting health as being a team sport and that we absolutely need to bring public health and health delivery system closer together and we have to be on one team. Um, for me, the, the start of knitting that together starts with our data exchange, um, but doesn't stop there to your point on like, how do we get down to the programmatic level? So there's a couple of threads here. One I think is, is importantly the data work that we are doing to knit folks together. Um, I think it's the partnership across the federal government because even if maybe CDC doesn't own every lever, CMS very much does. And we are 
my seven years of, of, of spending time at CMS thinking about how we can um, partner together. And I, I wanna thank uh, Chiquita um, and and John, John Chiquita Brooks Lashour and, and John Blum for their, their deep engagement. So we've actually been doing a lot of work together to think about how we bring some of the, the, the work together. Some of it is concrete on the data side, others is on the payment side to your point. Some of the reason we're not getting engagement on SUD um, has to do with thinking about how we're using our Medicaid 1115 waivers and what flexibility is, but we can get into that another time. Um, and so, but, but, but the question is, right, as we're seeing best practices and data emerge, how do we make sure that whether it's a SAMHSA or a CMS has the information on those best practices can use their tools as well in coordination? And it's why we called out that area of focus on mental health and substance abuse, because I think there's more we can do both here within public health and as well as being a great partner there. But I absolutely 100% agree with you. You will see in our winter virus uh, respiratory season work um, that we had most of our communication effort actually is focused on providers. Our data tells us over and over again that they are the most trusted and the most important reason why folks didn't get vaccinated is because their doctor didn't bring it up. So they just assumed it wasn't important. And so we've been trying to cut through. So I, there's more to say, but we, I really feel proud that the team is moving in the right direction, but always a lot more to do. And again, maybe as you guys talk about um, work groups, maybe there is something specific here on how do we work to bring healthcare and public health even closer together. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Julie. Thank you so much for the update and congratulations in your new role, relatively new role. Um, I would, I was, I have a comment. Well, for two comments, one is just, and I'm so glad that you are a strong advocate and proponent of the vaccines for adults program. I was worried. I mean, it just, it's been in consideration for a long time. Or and oh, vaccines. Sorry, for adults. can you sorry. hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Vaccines for adults program because I think it is a critical infrastructure piece that would be incredibly valuable for us in peace times as well as in the next pandemic. So just feel like that would be great. It's great to have your support on that. The, what I was going to respond, actually comment about was more was about the work group. I love this concept of building trust and focusing on communication and partner engagement. We were talking earlier in an earlier session about the critical role the community organizations played during the pandemic in terms of building trust within some of the more marginalized communities in the, in the country. And that there's some actually great models for work and CDC did some wonderful work with the adult vaccination efforts funding community organizations to get into more local grassroots efforts, but then also making sure that states and locals could use their federal resources to actually support community groups on the ground. At, you know, at RWJF, we are a national foundation, so we struggle with this. How do we support communities on the ground? Mm -hmm. And we don't try to really do it ourselves. We really do it by way of partnership with intermediaries who are who actually are closer to the ground. And I could see an opportunity for a CDC to play to use mechanisms like that similarly, but I, I would be a strong advocate in support of this kind of a uh, work group focused on building trust and focusing with the emphasis on community, community partnerships as well. Okay. We'll go to Octavio and then Nura. Uh, thank you. Oh, good to see you. We'll go to Nura and then Octavio. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so glad to see you out of the gate running strong with three really important initiatives. It's exciting to see the energy you bring, and I know the whole agency is excited by your vision. Uh, we, you've spoken a lot about community, about partnerships with state and local, partnerships across the government, and partnerships within CDC. Can you give a sense of what you're thinking about partnerships with the private sector? Because I think that's one thing that FDA has done well, other, other agencies have done really well. And how do you see that evolving over time? Because I think that's one opportunity area where there's unlimited upside with all of the new stuff coming on, on board with AI and technologies. And, and I don't know how we've formally done that yet. Well, great to see you, Dr. Shah. And um, love that question. And we have, we have been talking about that actively as a team. Um, I think that there are incredible opportunities to partner with the private sector um, in, in strategic ways around some of the, particularly the di new diagnostics that we're seeing in the global space um, where, where folks um, want to do incredible and creative things and want to then use some of the new emerging AI tools to help us think about how do you see 
threat signals from the, the noise that is out there. So um, I, I think that we are, we're working on how to make sure that we are, are engaging more deeply. I think that that hadn't been um, as top of mind as it had, that the pandemic showed us how important it was. Let me um, highlight a place where I, I saw it work well and a lesson learned from pandemic. So um, was in the laboratory space and partnering with the commercial labs for MPOX. So I think we, we saw there was some, some um, uh, you know, lessons learned certainly on the lab side. Thank you again to the lab work group on how to do better. I think you see some of those lessons already happen with the MPOX response. So when I talk to colleagues at Quest or at LabCorp, they already saw a difference, both in how we are just having ongoing conversations and sharing, um, uh, you know, best practices and information. But when we needed to turn on that machine again for MPOX, that I thought that was a real success of partnering with the private sector um, lab, uh, commercial lab space. And one, I think, will get embedded into the work that we do going forward. But I think we can do that on, on treatment, on, um, on, on AI, on data. Certainly, we're partnering the private sector a lot on, on data innovations. Um, so you'll, you'll see more and more, um, I think, for that. I think it's necessary. I did it in North Carolina. I think, um, I think there are places and times where the government innovates, and I'm proud of that. And there are times in the private sector, we have to leverage both. Thanks, David. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. Um, Octavio here. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, this country is at an inflection point when it comes to structural racism mm -hmm. and the impact at a systemic level. And obviously, that includes the CDC. And in 2021, CDC declared racism a public health threat. Mm -hmm. And however, things have changed so much in just the past three years mm -hmm. in reference to, especially I'm from the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. We just passed in Bill 17. It's an anti-DEI bill mm. and the pushback mm. uh, for making these, I think, changes that need to happen and even just acknowledging mm. in some cases. I'm just wondering, CDC made a commitment then wanting to make investments within its organization and then obviously, I think, being a leader, uh, especially from a public health perspective. How do you see going forward, given the environment and your vision and a strategic approach to continue to address structural racism as a public health threat. Great, thanks for that question. You know, the I, I want to go back to some of the work I did in North Carolina because I bring some of the lessons learned there, where um, we focused on thinking about how do we give everyone the opportunity for health, no matter the zip code they are born into or live in, um, and that was actually a very unifying theme for us um, in North Carolina. And I bring that lesson learned. So when you talk about maybe some of the the um, that work being divisive in a in a place like Texas, you know, North Carolina was a, a you know, a pretty purple state. Um, I worked for a Democratic governor, but I had a Republican supermajority. And what when I first joined, what was unifying for us was health. Folks wanted they wanted to be healthy themselves. They wanted their families to be healthy and they wanted their communities to be healthy. Now we all had different visions of what levers we pull to get there, but we could agree that that health was fundamental. And frankly, it was necessary for our economic success. And we started there. Now it doesn't mean we we fixed all the problems in North Carolina overnight. We didn't, but I am proud that we are going to expand Medicaid in a bipartisan way for the first time in like a couple of days. It took mm. seven years, but right, but we didn't right, we didn't get there all all the same day. But my point is, is thinking about what what are the unifying places that we can that that we can work on together um, that bring us closer to that vision of health. Um, health opportunities for anyone, no matter what zip code. Um, and that's sort of my North North star of the work. And then you get to work on these three pieces, transparency, operational excellence, and relationships. For me, when you're talking about the structural pieces, right, that's operational excellence. There are barriers that keep us from being able to be the most effective we can at, at achieving that vision. Um, one of the places that I, you know, I know we have talked about as a team 
And I think this work group can help us is how do we work more with community organizations? The one, one of the reasons why it is hard is because structurally the way we give out money and the, right is, is challenging both for us and for the community organizations we wanna work for. But I think there are ways to get past that, but we have to do the, do the operational work um, to, to sort of find our way to, to you know, improvements there. But I think that's only one, uh, you know, one of many examples. I, I do want to commend uh, CDC. I have, I worked in a lot of parts of government and I think that have all done good work. CDC leads with equity in um, such a fundamental way. Uh, it makes me very proud to be part of the team. Now, is there work to do 100%? And to your point, I think CDC needs to continue to be a leader. So it's everything from how we collect our data and report it. We still collect race and ethnicity in lots of different ways across the CDC and our programs. We can standardize that so that we write, just making things easier for our partners. Some small things like that and big things like how do we contract and partner uh, differently with community organizations. I think those are all the ways, um, you know, equity in all policy. Um, is the real approach. Thank you for that. You know, you mentioned the contracting and the CDC, the work it does. Is it possible to have like a small percentage, like three, four, maybe even five percent to be built in to the contracts that are addressing the structural racism or using the appropriate maybe uh, drivers in some cases the health disparities or maybe it's the social determinants. I think it'd be great if it was just built into that infrastructure. Just something to think about. Yeah. No. I think I think this these are the kinds of you know suggestions we want to bring to the surface and figure out what are the right ways because you don't. I don't know if I don't know if that's the right one or is there other ways and this is where also a partnership with philanthropy. Sorry to look back over at Julie. Ways to think about what are the ways in which different partners can help with that, right? Because I do think that in order to work with community organizations, they they are gonna have to work through a process of being evaluated and giving giving data over because that's, that's the currency with which we work. Um, and so how do we work with partners to help community-based organizations be better at tracking their work and, and uh, feeding you know data into these systems we did that in North Carolina so we actually partnered with um, with philanthropy to help some of our community-based organizations to be able to to do that work and right it not only um, furthered that work but it was it was community development right it's economic development work that we were doing so uh, it was uh, really powerful. And so we're looking for those kinds of partnership opportunities where we we are different, but there's other partners who are helping. So I don't want to prescribe the, the the solution yet, but I think that's something that a work group could could definitely dive into. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Octavio. We'll go to Monica. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. I don't know if you remember me, but I had the honor of uh, moderating a panel that you were on for the Public Health Communications Collaborative oh, that's Public right. Good Project. That's right. That's right. And the topic was around misinformation, yeah. Yeah. disinformation, and that how was you a build good trust. Yeah. And that it was, was uh, one of our highest you know, rated um, webinars. And I think what I appreciated then and what I um, am deeply appreciating now is your uh, insights that you bring around the importance of communication, transparency, even the ways that you framed uh, the ways of working related to transparency, operational efficiency, and relationships, those are the building blocks that we in philanthropy uh, describe in terms of trust-based uh, philanthropy and accountability to communities. And so uh, I, I wanted to just thank you uh, for that because I think your perspectives are really going to be important, particularly as we uh, think about how to operationalize uh, the fantastic work of the Health Equity Work Group with the leadership and counsel of Dr. LeBird and her team. When I think about uh, the metaphors that you all described around a team sport, you have a solid team. We are here mm -hmm. uh, on the bench uh, waiting to be sent out on the ice. <laughs> I'll stop there on the metaphors, on the sports metaphors. Um, but there's, it's, it seems like that we are at an inflection point, uh, particularly in this work. And I, I, I'm just really looking forward uh, in the upcoming months to um, hearing the same types of really robust 
uh, updates that we got from the laboratory work group in terms of how they're operationalizing, changing organizational structure, redesigning practices, really taking an enterprise approach, uh, being reflected in the work of the health equity work group. So thank you. I'd like to uh, ask uh, the ACD members who have not yet spoken up, if you'd be willing to, to speak up, if you have something to say, you don't have to. Um, people are welcome to weigh in again, but while we're thinking, um, I wanted to ask you a question. Maybe it's not a fair question. Maybe it'd be a question for the working group on trust, but um, there are so many different audiences out there around which it's important to build trust in public health, including trust within our own public health system, with community-based organizations, with uh, individuals we're trying to reach, with leadership. Um, in, in your time here, can you help us think about how you think about those different audiences and without necessarily prioritizing, um, where should, where, where are you feeling the need is most important to start? Ooh, that's a tough one. Because um, you, you can't just choose one. Um, the two, if I were to prioritize the two most important, um, one is to make sure that we are getting timely comments and solutions for, for real people, for, for, for Americans who are trying to keep themselves and their families healthy. They want to do the right things, um, but there's they, they, they need help sifting through all the noise, but they also need something that's going to work for them in their reality. Um, how do you bring the best of science and evidence and data, but also make it practical? Um, I think that's like an audience I really want to um, prioritize. And I think it means not just different messages and timeliness, but we have to use different mechanisms of communicating. So if they're on TikTok, we probably, mm -hmm. right, we need to think about how how can we be where folks are getting their information, right? If it's not going to be through the New York Times we <laughs> or the New England Journal, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what are the ways in which we can think differently about being where folks are getting their information? I think you're seeing that a little bit. We're trying, I'm on Insta, follow me on Insta, <laughs> um, right? We're trying to use more videos instead of written material, trying more podcasts, right? So just different mediums as well to get to. So that was number one. Second, um, are all of, to, to um, Dr. Sharfstein's point, are the, the pr provider community, yeah. um, whether that's our public health practitioners or our doctors and nurses, pharmacists, the, that, those are team members of team public health. Mm -hmm. um, but we all, like, in order for a team to function well, they, they have to know what, what play is being called to continue our, our uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> analogy here of the team sport, right? They need to know what, you know, when, uh, when to communicate what and make sure they have the good information. So we have to also be both communicating the most simple, timely, accurate to the American public. And we have to give the more detailed information to providers. And we can do both. We are doing both and we need to continue to do both. Um, and and there, are, there are ways in which we can make things more um, public facing and more provider facing. And I think we need to do both, but I'm sure. And then there are the deep practitioners, right? Yeah. The scientific community that we absolutely need to be more coordinated with um, and making sure, right? So if I was to say those three and now I'm probably left yeah. at an audience, but we, but, but again, I think we, we can operate on all three of those at the same time, the deep science and make sure that we are really getting all the nuances of what the science is teaching us, communicating that to our practitioners and then making it practical for real people. We can do all of those, but it, they take different messages and slightly yeah. different techniques and we have to recognize that as much as we respect the science and their skill set, there is a science to communicating, right? There is scientific evidence on behavior change, on implementation science that I also want to see us bring into this conversation. Thanks very much. Josh. Um, that, that's a great, great answer to that question. Um, I, I wanted to just build on that issue question about trust because it's not just, the, it's the audience, but it's also trust in who? And, the obvious answer is in part trust in CDC, you want CDC to be trusted. But, you know, I might suggest that thinking about that a little broader might also be useful, that it's really trust in 
public health as like a pretty close inside the circle there. And CDC could play a very helpful role sharing information about strategies and supporting local, state, tribal, territorial health departments as they're communicating. The more trust there is there, the more trust there's gonna be for CDC and vice versa. A specific example, just to make it more concrete, is one of the complaints, and you were there in the pandemic, so you can see whether you share this, but a lot of local and state health officials were frustrated that they were learning about major activity at the FDA like after it was happening, people had questions like, what does this mean for me? And that local health officers were totally unprepared. So that's not a great one for trust. And if you say like, well, it is a team sport and these guys need to be trusted, then you know, um, working with local and state health departments, asking what they need to be trusted and CDC being partly their voice and thinking about their needs, it's mutually reinforcing within, within public health. I didn't hear a question in there, but I, would, <laughs> I will say, um, I think great point, um, particularly when we are, if you will, in peacetime, right? We're outside of an emergency. How do we make sure that we are create, you know, uh, creating space to make sure we're getting feedback and um, that we're not surprising any anyone? Um, and that's one of the reasons that Andy, who's sitting next to you, is is here, right? Because I do think we needed to um, change and mature our 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 processes of getting in feedback and and hearing from 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 others. So I would say still a work in progress, but I hope you're starting to see some of that with the guidelines that we are doing when when we are in peacetime. We want to go through that thorough process. I, you know, I recognize that you know, and as someone who has led through crisis. Sometimes you learn a thing and you have to say it the same day and you're making a change. Um, and so that's going, going to happen. So, but when we have time, for example, we we have guidance out right now around using doxycycline as for, you know, um, uh, for STI uh, treatment um, as a preventive. And and you know, folks are getting getting input right right now on that. Does this work? Is this practical? How does it, what what should, what other things should we think about? What other populations? What time frame? You know those kinds of things. So I hope you're seeing us try to embed uh, those those uh, lessons learned. But I do want to acknowledge that in a crisis, sometimes you have to move fast, um, and we have to think about how we can do our our best. Again, that's when we have to kick into overdrive to to be listening um, and taking in as much as we can because we have to move fast. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon now. Um, yeah. Delighted to meet you and congratulations on your position. I'm Daniel Dawes. I, I was really excited to hear you talk about equity in all policies. And um, I heard many of your team or your colleagues uh, earlier today talking about an emphasis on equity, but I wanted to pivot to the workforce, public health workforce for a minute. You talked about the extension of the public health workforce to communities. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what are some of your priorities to making sure we bolster the public health workforce in light of early retirements and the attrition rate and all these yeah. things, you know, with burnout and so forth. Yeah. Serious about that. Yeah, workforce is a, a big topic. If I think about the core capabilities um, that we that you all were talking about when I first came in, I mean, there are, I think, five core capabilities that we need to have and fund across all of our efforts. Um, lab, data, response, global, and workforce. Um, so those are the five that I generally have in my brain when I think about what are the ways in which we need to make sure we have that foundation to, to do the work on respiratory viruses or to do the mental health work or to do the um, supporting young families work, right? If without that infrastructure, um, now, look, workforce is challenging, particularly in public health workforce, because it takes time to, to train people. But, and I would say everyone is feeling workforce challenges. Um, certainly health delivery system is in terms of, of nursing. Um, and, you know, we're seeing uh, challenges on all sides. So, you know, I think CDC has, has recognized for a very long time, we've always needed to to train folks, right, and had the EAIS program and uh, the PHAP program and like bringing folks in. I think there are ways in which we've asked Congress for some additional authority to take, be able to make sure we retain those trainees 
and convert them more quickly to full-time employees. We've taken the time to, to uh, integrate them and to train them up. We want to retain that talent and we need some more authority to sort of make that happen faster. It's one of our asks that we've been working on regarding our PAPA reauthorization work. Um, and, and I think this is a beyond CDC, right? Is how do we work with our institutes, uh, our, our public health schools and make sure one that we, we are finding ways to um, give folks exposure both to working in the field and working um, in, in the government and in academia and how do we make sure we're building skill sets where people can, can be in academia and then potentially be in, in practice. Um, and make that transition easier for folks. So I think there are a number of places. I'm I'm hearing um, Tom Frieden's voice in my head um, right now because he <laughs> he he um, you know he is an incredible advocate for making sure we have a strong workforce and that that workforce is well trained and has field expertise. Um, and I think so. It's both. It's like we can't just have bodies. I do want to say one program I'm super excited about was built during the pandemic was working um, with AmeriCorps and building a public health um, AmeriCorps, um, which I think was really exciting. I think it builds on sort of the tenants of community health workers and using folks who are trusted in their community um, to be able to do the public health work um, that is needed. I think that's an exciting um, uh, piece of work that we've been able to extend. But again, this is where within the confines of, you know, authority and funding, um, we'd love to be able to do even more there as we go forward. So I'll stop there. Octavio. All right, Cohen, I want to ask you a quick question about organizational behavior. So okay. um, especially now as the new leader of the CDC and having been on ACD and some other committees here at CDC, recognizing a lot of the work that's done here is moving toward more collaboration, more transparency, right? How is, what is your strategy for addressing the silo effect mm -hmm. that continues to affect all of us, no matter where you are, academia, federal government, even the private sector, but what's, gonna, what's your approach to ensure, you know, these mm -hmm. great things do happen, but we got to fight that silo effect inertia that yeah. continues to plague us. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, and Deb's laughing because I talk about it all the time. Um, I, this is, I, I like, I know it's really wonky, but I like get excited about having organizations work together as one team. It's what I, I was most proud of as I think back on the work in North Carolina and what I left behind was an organization that worked together as one unit. And again, that was health and human services. So bringing together early childhood education with the Medicaid program, with public health, with that, right, in service of health, as I said, health, uh, health for opportunities for all, no matter what zip code, right? And so that is how my brain operates. And so for me, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is you call out an area of focus and you get everyone moving on the same direction to be like, hey, we're all gonna, we're all gonna focus on fall and winter respiratory season. We're gonna put our data together. We're gonna communicate together as a team. Every single one of our leaders across CDC was yeah. doing work on um, the winter virus season no matter where they worked. So they didn't have to be in respiratory virus, right? Maybe um, I'm looking at Karen who is here, who works with our with pregnant moms and they are very much affected by what's going on with respiratory viruses. So perfect opportunity for Karen to talk to the community that she knows best about what was going on, right? So it, I think those areas of focus are weight, right? Because you can't light the world on fire all at once. I think you pick these areas of focus and drive them forward. I also want to go back to data. I think data is super critical to knitting together um, siloed organizations. How can you share data across um, what's going on in, uh, and Jono left like the HIV, Hep C world and what's going on in SUD? Of course it's related, right? Of course those populations are both impacted by HIV, TB, and substance, you write often substance abuse and mental health, right? And so how do we share data across programs? So data for me is also that organizational piece. And then it is, it is actual skill building and training. Um, I'm really excited that our policy and programs team is actually doing training on partnerships, uh, right? And doing the skill building on that, but we have an area of focus for folks to then effectuate that that training 
Um, I'm excited. Okay, last thing. Um, we last week we um, did some awards for all of our you know incredible scientific achievement, and that team decided to invite Adam Grant to the awards. Adam Grant is, um, I don't know if anyone has read his books. I'm kind of a fangirl of him mm -hmm. because he thinks about organizational behavior and how do you work differently and collaboratively as teams. And so he gave just, just a great presentation on how we can think about, again, skill building at every opportunity, even at an award ceremony. Um, so those are, we're, I think the team's thinking hard about about it and here's from me a lot of <laughs> so, well, I'm yeah. glad you're thinking hard about it. Thank you. <laughs> and Jill. Hi, um Jill Taylor. Um I'm a lab scientist. I'm a techie person. Mm -hmm. I love technology. Um congratulations on your job. Um have fun with it. Okay. So um I think public health we're not in an, at an inflection point yet, but we're getting closer to it, where the whole public health field is going to change from and move from the siloed laboratory with hard walls to point of care, non-traditional sites, the home. You know, we talk about the winter respiratory season. Pretty soon, we're going to have a toaster-sized box in our kitchen Mm -hmm. and and we'll put you know the, the capsule in and oh baby's got flu do I send her to school what what do I do I need a babysitter so we have to think about that in so many different ways one it's got to be cheap for it to be a, it, it's got to be cheap it's got to be effective you know we've got to our tests of so there's a lot of bad press about and bad talk about rapid tests during the pandemic because they weren't as sensitive as lab tests. But damn it, they gave you information. You know, I'm infectious or I'm not. Now, the next generation of tests, they are going to be as sensitive as lab tests, but they've got to be cheap, okay? So in terms of training, you know, our public health worker is going to be mum and dad at home or a nurse or um, a non-traditional site, person working at a non-traditional site. So we have to think about education. And we also have to think about data. And data and, and this new technology, we're worried about personal privacy, and I get that. You know, if I'm a, a non-documented immigrant, am I gonna say I'm COVID positive? and I have to support my family, maybe not. But is there data that we can get, come to um, consensus on? You know, if we had zip code, gender, positive, and that information went to the health department to say, oh, you know, zip code 12203 where I live, there's something going on here because there's a lot of positives. So I just think we have to think about the word public health is not about me. That's about somebody else. We have to think about population health in terms of personal health. I just think we need to change our thinking completely. And that's really exciting, but it's a challenge. I didn't hear a question in there either, but I, uh, but super, ex I mean, really exciting. Um, when I hear you talk, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm excited for the future, but yes, is there a lot in there that we need to think through and start to anticipate? Um, I think some of the foundational work that we're doing now puts us on the, on the road to where you're going because, you know, it goes back to David's audience question, right? You're needing to communicate with a large, very different audiences if we're in a point of personal uh, uh, personal health that feeds into population health. That's right. Um, and so I, I think that's really exciting. Um, but there's definitely some muscles to build. Data that data capture issue is I I love that. And I wonder if there's and I'm now Brennan joined um, who 
who joined uh, the, the team when I joined here um, as senior advisor to me for data strategy, because he has been working in, on the health delivery data side. He was chief data officer for CMS for a number of years. And so, right, to Josh's point about how we need to bring all of these pieces together. And I think data is one of the ways and we start to knit this together. I think a lesson we have to learn in public health is parsimony on our data, right? To your point, I heard three data points uh, zip code, gender, and positive or negative on the test. Hmm. I will tell you, most of our scientists will want a few more data points. <laughs> and so, but how do we get to that really streamlined way so that we can get initial signal to noid exactly, right? Signal to noise. I think I really, I really love that. So, thank you for for expanding our our thinking. So Deb and I had a little bet going into the session. <laughs> Right, I did win um, I, because I was thinking. I, I, she was saying, "Oh, it's going to go long," and I go, "I don't think this is going to go long. I think that people, in their first meeting with the director, are going to give some grace as far as how long to pursue a question and answer session, sort of on the record." We really, though, appreciate you coming. I think we've heard a lot of good input on the suggestions that you had for working groups, and we'll take that back and work on them and bring them back to you for our next meeting. Um, and in the context of relationship building, also look towards forward to the opportunity of, in more informal settings, creating those relationships with the people that are here. I'm going to give you just one last opportunity. Um, uh, can you um, just say a few words about if there's anything that you would most value um, as far as the relationship that you build with the ACD and, and how we can most help you? That's not a tough question. That's just an opportunity to tell us. Well, I think you're doing a great job. So thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, I would say, you know, help us help run ahead of us, mm -hmm. right? Is is I love where we were just having this conversation where 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 Jill just was about paint the future in 10 years. And what are the things we need to to be getting ready now to think about workforce or lab work? global or right what are those things that we need to think about now and um and and make sure that we are challenging not just ourselves here at cdc but challenges ourselves public health um to make sure that we are 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 ready and prepared um but other than that right the, but I, I think foundationally if we don't get at this trust building mm -hmm. like that future worries me yeah right and so I think there's the foundational trust that if you don't have, no matter how good your workforce is, you know, you, you, you won't be successful. So that feels foundational. And then help us really look out into the future and what are the ways where we, we need to be anticipating now. And so the, because the agency is going through a lot of change yeah. now, which is exciting and wonderful, but like, let's make sure we're going through the right change, right? Get, not just skating to where the puck is, but where it's going. Um, so There's those, that sporting those, metaphor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't help it. We're out, we're out on the ice together. Um, so I think yeah. those would be my 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 parting asks, but I just appreciate it. What a great conversation, um, opening my mind uh, to, to a bunch of things. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. We look forward to, um, working with you and helping you in your very tough but important job.